Good evening. Welcome to the March 17th, 2022 meeting of the Porcelain City Planning Board. I will note for the record that all members are in attendance except for Greg Mahana, who's out of state and unlike us, also unavailable by Zoom. So he's got a better, better evening ahead of himself. Um, I'm going to ask Franco DiRenzo Di to sit for Greg okay. tonight. And I believe the first item on our agenda is uh, approval of the minutes. I'd make a motion that we approve the minutes of February 17, 2022. Second. Um, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned earlier. I have a couple edits. <laughs> that this is the time. Okay. Uh, Greg also sent me some edits that I was going to, after there was a motion second, I'd mention those. I um, can't really give you a page. Uh, I can't give you a page number, but when we were discussing uh, it was just before the break, and I had questioned about uh, attendance, not understanding that situation. And Mr. Mahana was listed as the questioner, and that was me. I remember you asking. And it's written down as Greg Mahana. And um, the second correction I have is uh, related to uh, to Russell Street. I had asked for a, a shadow study, and uh, it's noted as being just to look at the community space, and I really intended that to mean the shadow study to look at the whole surrounding area. And also the same, it, it was referred to again as just a shadow study on the green area when I intended it for it to be the whole surrounding area. And then this is again probably a, a new person's question, but as far as the, the project at 230 Commerce Way, when I had asked uh, about uh, the, the proposed drive. Um, I was thinking also that maybe that the project should be looked at the Trees and Greenery Commission uh, Committee because that will be taking out a section of the landscaped island and a few trees. So again, I didn't say it at the time, but I, I probably would have liked to have said that at the time. Well, the first two, I think, are corrections that I remember. Mm -hmm. um, I do remember you mentioning the trees in the median, but not that you wanted it to be looked at by the Greenery Committee. That's correct. So I don't know if this is a time to bring it up or just I have to waive that concern. I think you'll have to wait until that comes back to talk about that third item. Do, do the other members remember the other two items? I do remember the shadow study. Um, <laughs> now I forgot what the second one was. Um, the you mentioning the, uh, the attendance. The attendance, yeah, I do remember that as well. So we, That's fine. Is everybody okay with those? Yes. Yes. Okay, so we have uh, Mr. Mahana also sent to me just a couple of quick things. Uh, his name was misspelled. It has two N's. And uh, on both the Green and Company's plans in Lafayette, he said that he had never, on Capitals, done business with them. And on Port Harbor LLC, he had also, again, in Capitals, never personally done business with them. So just as a clarification. Um, he sent those to me. I don't, I'm not going to make a practice of that. but. He's not here tonight, so and he's not available by Zoom, as I mentioned. So, with those modifications, if everybody's okay, yep. Any concerns? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Um, we have we had a request. I'm going to take one consider one item possibly out of order. Seven uh, A. There's a request for an extension, one-year extension for 163 Sparhawk. Um, they're right at the end of the agenda, which seems like it might might be a quick matter just to take care of. If we could have a motion to take that out of order and 
grant that extension if that's the board's pleasure. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. We have three items for um, motion for completeness. Well, if we take it out of order, don't we need to actually hear it right away? Well, I think the motion was to go ahead and do it, uh, but is it combined? Well, you have to take two, one to take it out of order okay. and then another one to actually vote for it. Well, then we Sorry. just took it out of order. Let's now decide whether we're going to grant the one-year extension. Mm -hmm. I make a motion that we grant the one-year extension. Second. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? All those in favor on that? Aye. 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 Now we are on to completion, completeness, <laughs> determinations of completeness. Um, we have uh, K Street Development as owner for property 428 U.S. Route 1 Bypass, 406 U.S. Route 1 Bypass, and 55 Kate Street. This for... Uh, Subdivision review and approval of the lot line adjustment. I'd make a motion that the um, application is complete. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. We also have a request for 238 Deer Street, LLC. I make a motion that the site plan review um, it has is complete. <clears throat> Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. We also have a request for K Street Development as owner for property 406 U U.S. Route 1 bypass for site plan review approval. Motion for completeness on that. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Did you have a question, Peter? The one before was you didn't ask. Was that Deer Street? Yes. I don't believe you asked for discussion. I don't. I didn't. That was my bad. Did you have a comment? I just wondered what the status was on the the parking. Is that something that we'll be discussing later? That is the when it comes up for actual conversation later on. All determination of completeness means there's enough information to proceed with a discussion. Thank you. It doesn't mean we've made a decision on any of the items in that package. I'm good. <laughs> We're good. We have now have public hearings um, under old business. We have a request of Kate Street Development as owner for property at 406 Route 1 Bypass, requesting amended site plan review approval to reconfigure and expand parking on tax map. 172, lot 2, tax map 172, lot 1, tax map 165, lot 2, to contain 73 new spaces, 52 of which should be covered, to renovate the existing structure on tax map 172, lot 2, and to add a bioretention stormwater facilities, stormwater collection and treatment facilities on tax map 172, lot 1, and tax map 165, lot 2. These properties are shown on the assessor's map 172, lot 1, 172, lot 2, and 165 lot 2 and they lie within the gateway corridor G1 district and LU-22-7 and we have Mr. Nicolaitis to present tonight I think good evening Mr. <coughs> excuse me good evening Mr. Chairman members of the board I'm Greg Nicolaitis from August Consulting uh, with me tonight is Jay Bisignano partner with Kate Street Development John Bozen attorney for the team Rick Lundborn Fusson O'Neill the civil engineer and Scott Tremontang from Montaigne Powers um, so I, I just want to start with a little bit of history um, on the project before I get into the technical part of the presentation. Uh, the West End Yards property was acquired in December 2017 by Kate Street Development. Uh, the project was approved in September 2019 after going through an 18-month approval process. Uh, as part of that process, I think everybody knows um, there was a land transfer to create uh, Hodgton Way that uh, goes through the site of City Street. At the time, West End Yards was, um, if you can put it, thank you. At the, at the time um, we were permitting West End Yards, the um, vacant 
car dealership out front was not part of the project. That was a separate lot. It got approved in 2017 for a 13,000 square foot uh, brew pub and restaurant. It was not part of our project. So, um, so that that's that's the first part. Um, and then when we uh, permitted the retail building, uh, that 44,000 square foot building, uh, we had no tenants at the time. So. Back in 2000, you're going to ask, well, you just got approval in 2019. Why are you here tonight for more parking? Well, back in 2017 to 19, we were using the parking tables that the city has based on theoretical. I'm pleased to tell you tonight, we have letters of intent for 95% of retail C and D, um, uh, both floors of retail C and D. I can't disclose the tenants. The one, the one that came out in the paper, uh, Buffalo Wild Wings, They'll be at the uh, bypass side of the uh, site. We have another tenant, uh, restaurant tenant for the um, west side, uh, east side of the site, I'm sorry. Um, that'll be more breakfast and lunch. And then we have uh, a large corporate tenant that's based in Portsmouth that wants to take the top floor and portion of the bottom floor. So we're pleased they're going to stay in Portsmouth. So we're before you tonight with actual parking. We know what the tenants want. Um, those leases have not been signed yet. It's based on this. We've been through the TAC process for, you know, last three or four months. But that's that's the short answer of why you're here tonight for more parking for a project that just got approved. Also, in your ordinance, um, the for uh, apartments under uh, 500 square feet, you only need a half space. What we're finding out in this location, it's really almost one. It's not everybody, but the majority of the people need one space. So that's... That's the need for more parking. Your your middle one, the um, let me get let me get these numbers right. Yeah, so the units 500 to 750, where you need one unit, one space per unit. That's about right. What we're finding out with the units that are 500 to 750, instead of 1.3 per unit per your ordinance, we need 1.5. So if you try to do all the math, we're here tonight. Um, there's a midpoint. Your, your, your minimum in your ordinance is 556. That's what we got approved. We just, it was based on theoretical. Tonight we're asking for 622. Your maximum is 668. So we're right in the middle. We're not asking for the maximum number of parking. We're not asking, you know, we came in at the minimum. So that, and just, that's just, history so I think the only maybe only Beth was on the board back when we were permitting it so I just want everybody to know how we got here um, so so with that background so the, the plan you see right there not only to, to get that added parking that we need um, we're incorporating what we're calling it retail D which is the vacant dealership so we've now integrated that into the project and then the um, the railroad we approached approached the railroad to uh, purchase some property, get some head-in parking there. So that's what you see, that long extension. So um, that's where we are as part of the TAC process. Um, staff was adamant that they wanted that covered parking. Um, we didn't necessarily agree. Um, we did view, view lines from all the streets and intersections. You really can't see that park. And not, not say you really can't see, you can't see that parking. But we agreed anyway to put the covered parking. Um, Rick, uh, Plus and O'Neill submitted a letter that you guys have in your file with, with the rendering. So um, with that, I'm not trying to overcomplicate this. Rick's here to answer any technical questions. John Bozen, any legal questions? Uh, Jay, for any uh, ownership questions on the leasing and so forth. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I've got a quick question, Greg. You said 622. The plans, I think we have 624 in the plans. Is that... I think we lost two because of the parking structure. Am, correct. I, am I right? Yeah. yeah. The parking structure, when you go and put those in, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Rick yeah. Lundborn with Bus and O'Neill. When we accommodated the two. Microphone. Sorry. When we accommodated the two um, covered parking structures on the 50 spaces along the railroad, it had originally been 52, but to make sure we had room for columns and things like that, we reduced it to uh, 50. And that was what was agreed upon with planning staff. So we ended up losing two over there. Okay. And everything you're talking about is inside the red outline? Correct. Yes. Um, you want to go to the next slide? 
<clears throat> yeah, and, and this just, um, TAC had asked for clarification, kind of, you know, it's not, there's not designated parking, but how would you allocate the parking? So that, that's what this plan's trying to show, um, the allocated parking. Then if you go one more, if you don't mind, go to the next one. And, and this shows, the, the, the first plan was the existing conditions. This is the proposed. Okay, well, I've, I, I sort of dominated here. Who, I'm sure board members have questions. Jane? I had a question. Um, so that includes what was formerly like a pet zone, is that right? It now will become more asphalt? I, because I have a hard, if you look at the original, well, at least, if you look at site plan overview, it yep. shows a pet zone on that. So, I mean, it, it relates to my general question about open space, because um, this is like a sea of asphalt becoming bigger if we grant your request. Um, actually, the pet zone stays. Um, we don't we don't overtake the pet zone, um, and the grass area adjacent to that stays. Um, so there, there are also residents in this stru in these structures, right? No, the two carports. No, um, in the buildings that you've built, there um, are residents, right? In the two large. Let me see. So, yeah, so this building is apartment building B, and this is apartment building A. Yes, there's residents in those. And there's a nice courtyard in the middle between them here as well. Um, yeah, yeah, we're not asking for any lot coverage. We, we far exceed green space. We far, we, we're far below building coverage. We're, we're not asking for any relief. We're... we're um, Building A is fully occupied. That's apartments. Building B is leasing right now. That'll be that'll start oc occupation in April. Uh, pending, you know, a, a positive outcome tonight, secure the leases, and we hope to fill uh, retail C and D sometime this summer fall. So it is an active. Yeah, there's people living there. Are you okay, Jane? Is yeah, that, that, thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes, Jim? Yes, uh, I'm having a hard time figuring out exactly how many spaces you're requesting. Um, how many spaces are you requesting above what was approved in 2019? 120. 120. There, there, there will be 56. Um, sorry, break this up. That go with this building here and then there's the 50 covered spaces along the railroad then there's some tandem spaces there and it all comes out to 120. there's okay. some that have to be eliminated to make connections okay that's confusing because i looked at the plan approved in 2019 and said you were going to provide 529. it's 503. I'm just going what I looked at maybe it was, I got my plans off the city website as far as what was what was submitted on September 26th so anyway that's one issue that's been confusing and then in the city packet it talks about 76 spaces and 73 spaces so Again, it's just overall confusion about how this project is changing from what was approved in 2019. And, and what you're telling me is that this project will have 120 more spaces. Um, yes, and some of those were associated with a previous retail use that has been vacant for years. So this is the Kia lot? The Suzuki Kia lot, yes. Again, it's you're combining, you know, properties here. That's correct. It's not easy to separate yeah, no, what's I, what. We had the same conversation <clears throat> as we were going through all this. So yes, no, you're not. Can I continue? Do you have any tenants that don't own a car there? Uh, 
Hi, Jay Vizignano. Um, no. Interesting. So, again, as when when this was approved in 2019, we were assuming there would be 35 people at your development when it was built out that didn't own a car, which is quite striking. It, yeah, it, it would be great if they didn't, but I think the reality is is that they do. Right. Right. So, uh, again, it's, it's just reality, but it, 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 it's sobering to me, I think, for the city to realize that our Sydney ordinances are that far off as far as predicting parking demand. Right. <clears throat> um, I guess my other question is I happened to observe the November TAC meeting and at that time, I believe you're requesting two spaces for the units above 750, and now you're looking for 1.5. Yeah, it's not an exact science. I mean, it, we're not. It's it's what we're telling you is reality. Is I, I, Jim, all I can tell you is we're not asking for any relief. We're asking midway what your ordinance allows. We're not asking for minimum. We're not asking for max. So. It, it, and I was afraid of this. Rick and I spent a lot of time on the phone today. I said, Rick, you know what's going to happen? We're going to get into each unit, each, and, and that's not the way your ordinance is. Your ordinance is shared parking. You know, we prepared a plan in color to show rough, but it, it's not, you know, there's the other thing, you know, we didn't talk about what's different now is COVID. You know, people aren't all getting in their car at 8 o'clock in the morning and leaving, so a lot of those cars are sitting there all day long. So that's different from the ordinance and from what we're all used to. This is even different. I mean, when we designed it, you know, uh, Jay opened up the Viridian, very successful, fully leased. There, your ordinance wasn't too far off. It was like right on. It's the parking. Thing. So th things have happened in the last two or three years, and that's why I tried to give you guys an introduction. Hey, why are you here two years after the fact? Well, we're here because now we have 98% of the leases in hand, we have one building fully occupied, and they're learning from building two. So before we fully lease building two, we got to figure out the parking. So that's why we're here. I mean, that's, I, I'm not trying to be a wise guy. I'm just trying to I, give you I, the context. Yeah. I hope you understand. I'm not trying to be a wise guy either. It's okay. just that, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm trying to understand how, 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 why we were so far off. Right. Oh, we are too. I mean, we, we, we leased building one and said, uh-oh, and the railroad land's not cheap. That's a big, big number that we're adding to this. We, we always wanted the, the front building at the time. Uh, the gentleman wasn't willing to sell it when we started our permitting. Um, so what, how I've kind of rationalized it, our, our building, that brew pub is a third of the size that got approved previously. So that helps, you know what I mean, from a traffic standpoint, from a parking. If he was there with 13,000 square feet, it'd even be a bigger mess, quite frankly. Right. I have one point of clarification, and then Mr. Clark has a question. Are you proposing any changes that are outside the red outline? No. So everything we're talking about tonight is inside the red outline? Correct. Um, I understand there was a bond required with the initial approval? Bond. A bond? A, a, probably a site work bond, you mean? You, and, and has that been released yet? No. So if there were any conditions in the prior application that had not been met, that bond would not be released until those conditions are satisfied? Right. There's a third party. Uh, Underwood Engineers has been working for the city for the last uh, year and a half on the construction. They're observing all the construction on your behalf. Okay. I just I want the board to understand that there is there's additional review that's taking place but I also understand the comment about the ordinance I've got some issues with it myself and other locations but mr. Clark I'm sorry go ahead thank you chairman um, so I guess just to uh, you know kind of follow up with what the chairman was discussing um, and others about the parking the um, the only changes outside of this additional lot that you have subsequently purchased is those tandem spaces correct no and and in the head in the, there's a row of head in that's against the that's land being acquired there's 30,000 square feet being acquired correct I mean yep. on the on the the pre-existing lot that was yes, yes. previously approved yes. are only those those tandem spaces okay. yes yep um, 
a couple more, Mr. Chairman, if that's all right. Yes. Uh, and as part of that, um, I would assume that this is going to be part of a revised AOT stormwater? Correct. Um, okay. And I know along here you had um, where these spaces are going along the railroad property, you had snow storage there. I know you also had the big snow storage area right next to the dog park. I know that got a little smaller, I believe, but um, is is that an issue? Um, I mean, where did that storage get shifted to? I'm not, I'm not sure what they're doing right now for snow storage. Um, okay. We'll let Jay speak to where he puts it. <laughs> I think if we get a lot of snow in any given winter, we're going to have to ship it out. Okay. And then my final questions just kind of relate to the uh, the covered um, the covered building. And I apologize, um, I didn't I didn't watch the, uh, the the TAC meeting, but I'm just curious um, the discussions, the reasoning behind having that that covered parking, and. To add on to that, my my second question is: the way you have it um, shown conceptually is it's going to be uh, a uh, pitch roof with the pitch coming behind the lot. I mean, behind the parking and in front of the parking. Is that going to cause any snow and ice buildup in front of those parking spaces as snow and ice sheds off that roof? Um, the short answer is no. We'll have to deal with it. The at the TAC meeting, if you watch that, I pushed back about we did not want covered park, and I actually went out there and did some view lines um, between the retail C and D from the bypass up from Borthwick, from the two site drives, and from the townhomes, and that land is tucked back in along the base of. So we got delayed a couple months, quite frankly, to work through that with staff so that we're we're agreeing to it um, don't get me wrong we're agreeing to it tonight but you ask why we're doing it it's not something we came up with and i guess my question is so what was the staff's reasoning for having the covered parking there? they were concerned of they wanted to break up that parking from the railroad view corridor if there was ever passenger trailer passenger trains i can't speak for the staff but they that's it was um it was to protect the view corridor okay Okay. Um, yeah, I guess that's that's it for now. Thank you. Anybody else? Is Jim? Um, I'm reading from staff memo. Okay. Um, item number eight starts off as alternate parking layout. If the evidence does not support the proposed parking expansion, open space areas should not be reduced or impacted so that leads me to believe do you have any evidence to support your need for more parking like have you done a not door-to-door -door survey and itemized all your apartments who lives there number of bedrooms how many cars uh, we have so uh, any resident that comes into the development has to state if they have a vehicle how many um, we also have requirements from our retailers on how many spaces that they need to operate and be successful. So, yeah, we have the data. Um, that's frankly why we're here. It's not – we don't want to be before you, but we need to be. Right. And I'm just trying to – the reason I'm being so – what's the word <laughs> – inquisitive is I don't want to do this again. I don't want you to come back in a year and ask for another 100 spaces. I don't see any way we could do that as a practical matter, so I think this would be the last time. So did your survey, is it, would it be in a document form that you could submit to us that sure. shows how you've developed, you know, this parking demand? Because this is a great little project. You Real data, here absolutely. For us to use in the future about Portsmouth Living spaces, size, and parking demand. Sure. So I would, you know, again, I, the key word here is evidence. And we've, you've presented your information verbally, but it would be great to have that on a report. Absolutely. Okay. Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I guess just kind of follow up, stay on the parking topic. Um, you know, one of the um, one of the comments that we got was um, the feasibility of you know actually making this structure, this covered parking structure, taller to allow for you know the possibility of future stacked parking. If say you're you know say you're uh, you end up needing more parking, is that is that even feasible um, at all? I don't even know if you know you can do stacked parking you know in kind of an open structure such as that i believe you can but i'm not positive so yeah um having had a little bit of experience with lifts and such um you know one of the requirements for them to run smoothly and safely is a 24-hour attendant mm -hmm. and i think again as a practical matter um that'd be a difficult one for us um so I don't think I, I appreciate the suggestion, but I but I don't think a lift system is is practical here. Where you see lifts, and where I guess I have experience with with lifts, are in um, are in urban dense settings, um, and I'd argue that this is not an urban dense setting. Okay, thank you. Jane. I just want to say that I agree with point seven in our notes, which talks about how this parking layout really conflicts with the master plan about a vision of a West End that's supposed to be walkable neighborhoods, um, that the whole scale of it to me seems it's the sea of asphalt that I just can't get around. I, I don't see that that's walkable. I don't see that that's a good quality of life. For any of the neighborhoods around there and I still don't understand if we are talking about 73 okay 76 spaces 73 spaces or didn't you just state previously 95 spaces how many spaces are we actually voting on here okay so I'm gonna answer the first question so what, what may be confusing is those are the TAC comments that um, on page 3 Mm -hmm. at the February 1st meeting. So you're right, that's comment eight. Then if you go down to the box on the bottom, it says the applicant has addressed these. So what, what we did a poor job of the first time was incorporating um, building D into the site. We, we, we just left it as it was, and we said, okay, building D. So one of the TAC comments was make it more of a walkable connection. So what we've done is we've added that driveway and we've added the crosswalk and the sidewalk to connect building C to D. So that's like a carryover comment that we addressed. Can, can you show where that is up on that, please? Sure. Sorry. It's right here. There's a crosswalk, that dark line, and there's a break in that parking lot right there where you see um, the, between the islands. So you can you can drive right through and you can walk right through and then walk up to building C. So that that's that's a change that was made after the February first TAC meeting. Okay, and how many spaces are we talking about? Go over that again. So again, we're adding a total or including a total of 120 spaces. 56 of them go with the previous uh, Suzuki Kia, Kia dealership lot. There is actually a reduction in pavement on this lot by about 5,500 square feet. Like many car dealerships, it was paved pretty much to the extent possible to have display area beyond just re regular parking. Um, so there's 56 here, and then there's 50 spaces along the railroad, and then an 11 additional spaces here that are tandem. That doesn't come out to 120. I'm sure everyone's sitting there going, wait a minute, that adds up to 127. We had to eliminate three previously approved spaces here and four previously approved spaces here to make the connections up into the parking along the railroad. That's 120 all told. So there's the 56 that are associated with uh, tax map 172, lot two, and then 64 net, including the tandems that are being 
uh, done along the railroad. So that's 120. After the eliminations for connections and things. Frank, yeah. Am I missing something? But on the tandem spots, are they going to be like designated? Those would be designated per tenant that had two cars, so right. they can't park somebody in. Right. Mr. Chairman. So Greg had alluded to the averages and weighted averages of parking versus unit size. And what was also mentioned was the parking space allocation for the commercial and retail spaces or um, buildings. So does the opportunity exist or is there leeway for the second residential building for some of those tenants to not have a car as you do the lease up process there? Is there an opportunity to say you cannot have a car? I'll let the owner of the property speak to that. Um, I think that you could require that they don't have a vehicle, but one of two things are going to happen. One is they won't lease the unit, or two, they're going to go park in a neighboring building or in the neighborhood illegally. Right. I think what's important just for me to reiterate is the data is real. This is happening, and people have vehicles. Um, as I said before to Mr. Hewitt, I wish that they didn't, and I wish that we could say that to somebody. But if we did, we'd have vacant buildings. I have a question. I think it's for Ty and Bond on your I don't particularly agree with this dimension, but there's a 20-foot dimension shown for your maneuvering aisle behind that head-in parking. Yeah, it, it was 22 one way. The spaces are, uh, the buildings themselves are 21 feet deep. Um, it's a one-way aisle that accesses those. The spaces inside the buildings are 19 feet deep. So there's some f flex room there. But well, the plan shows 20. Are you and that's to where there may be posts and things, so the point of most. So, and it is one way, you've got to designate. Correct. Our ordinance says 24 feet, which is. Two way. And then it allows for a reduction for one way. Okay, so TAC reviewed that, and they're good with the way you've shown it as a 20 feet clear, basically, with additional asphalt for yeah, it is other things. Correct. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Being none. Actually, I just I may not have this, but uh, I, is it true that the current impervious is about 67% on the site itself? On Off the top of my head right now, I couldn't tell you, but I do know that there was a reduction between the original properties before uh, K Street Development got involved to today of about almost, I think it was 1.8 acres. It's probably a little less than that now. So 1.8, I'll, I'll round down, I'll say 1.6 after this addition acres of impervious was removed from this property by the redevelopment. I was just trying to get a rough estimate of how much that percent would change with this these 120 new spaces <clears throat> well again some of that was the front lot which was paved right. pretty much to the line before mm -hmm. now we've reduced that down by 5500 square feet okay so mm -hmm. there is a bit of an offset i wouldn't go so far as to say it's even half of the stuff along the, the railroad but the amount that we reduced it overall from before is picking up a, a good chunk of that but we're not over the allowed impervious right <clears throat> Just okay. to clarify what you said, 56 spaces on the front lot with a net reduction it, covered it, covered area, 64 on the back net because you had to take a few out. Correct. Okay. 120 total is what we're under. Correct. Okay. Any other questions before the public hearing? Being none, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anybody here who wishes to comment to for or against the application?
Please state your name and address for the record. Sure. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Bradder, property owner of 159 McDonough Street. I would like to ask that you ask two suggestions for the approval of this plan for Building D and the proposed increase in parking along the railroad tracks. I appreciate that they are trying to be more realistic about the parking needs of their people. I have stated numerous times that I have technically micro apartments and every one of my tenants has a car. They may not drive to work in it, they may leave it in my parking lot, but they own a car. So it is unrealistic to think a half a space is enough for an apartment that's gonna have one young person in it. They like to drive home, they like to go to the mountains and all of that other stuff. So I think their assessment for parking is real. I'm very saddened that I didn't get involved in this project sooner because I would have liked to have seen a lot more of that asphalt covered up. So the whole concept of parking is that you park once and it seems that most of the parking they're looking for is residential. Um, and that means you either park your car at home and then you walk to all the different places on this property or you walk downtown or wherever you wanna go. But this is a very walkable area uh, if you can find a place to park when you live there. So I would like to ask that you approve this with these following stipulations. I realize that they don't think they're gonna need more parking because they've done all the math. But when they start to have shared parking overflowing with people who work at home all day, that they may need more parking. And therefore, I would like to ask that when they build those buildings, they make the interior height 14 to 15 feet tall so that stacked parking can go in. And if they think that they're gonna need more parking anywhere on this lot, that they enclose it and they make it stacked. Now, although they presented that urban people only use stacked parking, that's not true. There's stacked parking, as far as I know, on Brewster Street at the old Brewster Street um, house that was there. They have stacked parking back there. One Rains Ave is just about doing their whole parking lot in stacked because they don't have enough room for all of their parking. Um, and Rain, um, Brewster Street is my understanding that the people who own the condos do their own stacking of their cars. They're not hard to do. You do need someone professional to set them up but you don't have to be too smart to be able to move your car around. You just have to be smart enough to have enough clearance and therefore the suggestion of 14 to 15 feet because if you put your Suburban on the top and you forget that your garage is only 12 feet tall, you might have a convertible Suburban. So please insist that they make those buildings on the interior 14 to 15 feet high and if they have to add more, it's stacked and enclosed. And it's my understanding that the reason why they're asking those buildings to look nice is because the people at the dog park don't want to spend all their time looking at a parking lot. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else two for or against this application? Yeah, speaking to it, John Shagnon from Ambit Engineering. Sometimes the light bulbs go off at odd times. You're also dealing with the lot line relocation plan right now you didn't separate them or They're, that's next uh, okay that's separate thank you hmm. anybody else here this evening or on zoom wish to speak to for or against this application nobody on zoom any second time speakers third time speakers Still nobody on Zoom. We we'll close public hearing. It's a pleasure of the board. Not all at once. So I'll, I'll gladly make a <clears throat> motion, Chairman. Um, but just based on the last comment, with, um, Mr. Shagnon, the first vote in here is for subdivision approval. Did you want to? I had a mind notes differently. Mr. Chairman, we never took a motion to discuss them together, but to vote on them separately. I don't know if we can do that at this point in time. Yeah, well, I to get to where I Mr. Think we just, okay. We, we just queued up the site plan. Okay, so we'll, we'll we, could, we could have done both. Okay, so I'll make a motion to vote to grant site plan approval with the following stipulations. A, or 
A through E in the staff planning memo? Second. And just a just a comment on that. Um, you know, I, I I think in this case, um, you know, my my thinking of this particular project is is while you know, parking is an obvious issue anywhere in the city. Um, you know, the in my mind, the people who are going for this particular development are the ones that want to have cars. You know, they, they're sacrificing, um, you know, living directly downtown, right in the um, downtown district moving outside a little ways and you know electing to have a car at that so to me it kind of makes sense um and it's good to see that they are you know actually i think incorporating this this additional lot um because yeah it was kind of just a weird cut out in the um in the overall site development so i think overall it's actually going to be um, a better site in the end <clears throat> We have a motion and a second, uh, Councilor Moreau. Um, I'd just like to make a comment. I have actually been part of this plan since the very, very beginning, and I have spent a lot of time looking at it. I, um, I'm, I'm saddened by the fact that we need more parking. A little bit like the owner is. It's not, you know, it's not what we envisioned when we wrote the code because we we're really trying to encourage a more walkable city and less, less cars. But the fact of the matter is, I think that the pandemic has is kind of, you know, ruined that for a lot of people. Um, and they're staying home more, so they need more parking. Um, with that said, that uh, I do think that my land use committee will have to take a long, hard look at our parking regulations along with all the other regulations that we're looking at, and that will definitely be on our list to look at, and I've taken some notes for that. Um, but I, I think this is just a somewhat simple way of solving the solution now, and knowing that they have as many um, leases in, I think that this parking is appropriate and well laid out, and I have no issues with the expansion. Jim, can I make an amendment to Corey's motion? You can propose one. I propose one. Um, I like a, a report submitted on the on the traffic that justifies these numbers. That includes the area of the apartment, number of bedrooms, number of occupants, and the number of cars. You said traffic. Do you mean parking? Parking. I'm sorry. Correct. I. Th I think the applicant said they had that. Right, but I haven't submitted it. Yes. But, but they agreed to submit it. But they agreed to submit it. Is that would that satisfy that? Yes. If that if that's submitted as part of this approval. So it'd be a condition to. An additional condition to submit the report that they said they've compiled. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have a second to that proposed? I, yeah, I'm, I'm agreeable to add that as a condition um, F on on here. Are you okay with that? Uh, yeah, if it's just submitting what they've already compiled, I'm fine with that. Yes. Any other comments? And I apologize if everybody thought we were doing both at once. Probably I should have done that. My bad. Um, so we have a motion to approve with the conditions as listed in the staff memo with one additional one being the submission of the report that the applicant said they have compiled already. If there's no further comment. All those in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. So now we will move on to the boundary line adjustment. Which I don't think I read. So it's a request of uh, Kate Street Development LLC in Boston Main Court for properties at 428 U US Route 1 bypass, 406 Route 1 bypass, and 55 Kate Street for preliminary and final subdivision approval for a lot line revision to convey 31,187 square feet from lot 165, lot, map 165, lot 114, to map 172, lot 2, and map 165, lot 2, which would result in a total of 52,820 square feet lot area for map, lot 170, map 172, lot 2, 126,500 square feet for map 172, lot 1, and 260,789 square feet of lot area for map 165 lot 2. These properties are shown on assessors map 172 lot 1, 172 lot 2, and map 165 lot 2, and 165 lot 14. 
they lie within the transportation corridor and the gateway corridor district LU-22-7. Is there anything the applicant would like to explain about this? Again, for the record, Greg Michelaitis from August Consulting. Um, no, we discussed it. If we go back, I'm sorry, go back to the third sheet. Um, what you just read um, into the record um, was what we talked about, the, uh, the front lot and um, 31,000 square feet of land from the um, railroad. We have a purchase and sales with um, positive vote tonight. That sale will occur prior to end of April. Any questions of the applicant on this? So I have to open a public hearing. Is there anybody in the audience that can speak to, for, or against? Now's your time, John. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. John Shagnon from Ammon Engineering. And if we can put up the lot line relocation plan. As I said, light bulbs go off sometimes. And I apologize in advance to the design team that uh, they're getting hit with this now. But uh, I did some work for the so called uh, flooding that occurred at the um, old Frank Jones Brewery on Islington Street. And what happens there is the property has been developed. That property was developed and uh, it was developed after the railroad was built. And uh, the plan isn't up here, but, and they might have made some accommodations for this, but I didn't see it on the survey plan. Is there a better plan for you to be referring to? Yeah, the lot line relocation plan. Yep, thank you. So what we discovered is that there's a, a large culvert pipe that goes under the Boston Main Railroad uh, about this location. These are the buildings on the back end of the Morley Button factory, mm -hmm. and all the drainage from the parking lots in front actually run into a collection system that runs underneath the building, out the back, under that railroad culvert, and then goes down to the highway drainage on the bypass. And the flooding at the um, uh, at the Morley Button Factory, which is many properties, 1001 Islington, 909, so on and so forth, uh, they were having flooding in the parking lots and they didn't know what was, they needed a cure. Excuse me, you, yep. you might want to read that last condition of approval. That's it. <laughs> yeah, and so the owner before agreed to let them clean it out, and that allowed the water to flow. And it appears that the applicants are going to give an easement so that can continue. Thank you. I didn't see it on the survey plan, so it should be added. It's on the site. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak to, for, or against this application? Anybody on Zoom? Second time speakers, third time speakers. Close the public hearing. Board's pleasure on this part of the application. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we vote to grant preliminary and final subdivision approval with the following stipulations A through D in the planning staff memo. Second. And with the addition of that easement to get noted on the plan? It's actually on the site plan approval. Okay. So we're good. Any other comments? Would you want to explain your it seems pretty straightforward? Yeah. Yep. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. We have a public hearing. Uh, actually, we have two requests to postpone. I assume those are still valid. Do we want to take care of those just to get rid of them or not? I'd make a motion that we uh, pull forward the um, applications that wish to wish to postpone. So for 
We'll take 4B and C together or just one at a time? One at a time? Um, we can take them together. Let's see. Okay. We have a request to postpone the request of uh, Donald Lowell Stickney III as owner for property at 213 Jones Avenue. Requesting a conditional use permit under Section 10814 of the Zoning Ordinance and modification of the standards set forth in Sections 10814.40 and 10814.52 through 10814.56 to construct a new single family residence and convert that residence into a detached accessory dwelling unit totaling 886 square feet. The property is shown on Assessor Map 222, Lot 69, and lies within the single residence B district. And the applicant has requested that be postponed. The second. It's just B that's postponing, right? Oh, Not B and D. It's D and C. It's C and C. And D. I had B and C. B and C. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are we good? Sure. I didn't have it on my notes, so <laughs> you know, I was confused. Is, that, is that a new thing? We don't have that in our notes. Yeah, the only one listed on my agenda, anyways, is B. That's why I was questioning what else was actually postponing. Um, if I could add a little uh, information on that. It was revised. We had a uh, some changes from the Board of Adjustment related to C last night, and we asked for them to uh, resubmit. There's some small changes, but significant enough that we said, well, let's get that cleaned up and bring it back. So C was also requested for postponement um, okay. to adjust to the, um, the stipulations provided by the Board of Adjustment. Gotcha. Thank you. And C, just for the record, is a request of Nirvan Family Revocable Trust as owner for property at 189 Gate Street, requesting a conditional use permit under 10.815 as zoning ordinance, which modifies standards set forth in 10.815.30 for the conversion of the existing accessory structure or garage into a garden cottage with 546 gross square footage of living space. That property is shown in Assessor Map 103, Lot 6. <clears throat> in the general residence B district and historic districts. Also, this, the applicants requested a postponement. Working with staff, we have two. Was that a motion? Well, we didn't, I had made a motion to bring them forward and we didn't vote on that. Okay, so the motion right. is to bring them forward. Do we have a second? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So they, we brought them forward, now postpone them? Correct. Mm -hmm. I'd make a motion that we vote to postpone um, public hearings new business for B. Second. Second. And B? I was just going to do them one at a time. Okay, so this is for B C? <laughs> I was doing B first. We have to take a vote. We have yeah. to vote. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And then I make a motion that we um, vote to postpone public hearings, new business, item 4C. I think Second. you said C twice. No, I said B the first time. Okay, then I misheard. <laughs> Could be just my voice. I can't talk. <laughs> I whispered in the back. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We have postponed items 4B and C. Item 4A is a request to 238 Deer Street LLC as owner for property at 238 Deer Street, requesting site plan approval for the demolition of the existing structure and construction of a new three to four story mixed use building, <clears throat> 21 residential units with a footprint of 5,263 square feet, more or less, and 19,190 square feet of gross floor area with associated site improvements. This property is shown on assessor's map 125 as lot three and lies within the character 4 district or CD4, the downtown overlay and historic districts. John, you are here to present for the applicant. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. John Chagnon from Ambit Engineering, representing 238 Deer Street, LLC. For this project with me here tonight, uh, Richard Desjardins and Mark Giannini from uh, McNabb Architects. I mean, McHenry Architects, sorry. Too many McNabb projects in my brain. Sorry. <laughs> so this is the uh, formerly the VFW Hall. Uh, now it's the Stady Bar and Grill. And uh, this project has been going through the approval process for some time. Just a brief recap of the history. Uh, February 18th in 2021, we were before the planning board for a conditional use permit for parking, which was granted to provide no on-site parking. And uh, the ZBA meeting on September 28th in 20, 
21. The variances were granted for open space and some yard setback issues. On November 3rd, 2021, the HDC uh, also approved the project. Uh, December 7th of 2021, the Technical Advisory Committee recommended approval with some stipulations. And last month's planning board meeting, we were back to request the one year extension of the conditional use parking, uh, conditional use parking approval, which was granted. So the store, the, the project is to provide for much needed micro housing in the downtown. 21 units, it'll have first floor retail. It's a um, replacement of the building that's there now. So it's a tear down and replace. In the plan set, there's two easement plans. Uh, the first easement plan shows some easements on the westerly boundary of the site that deal with the abutter, the 30 Maplewood Condominium Association. There's an exchange of some easements. There's some easements that will allow the building to have more glazing. It's a, a no-build easement that the 30 Maplewood Association is granting. And then the 238 Deer Street LLC is granting an easement to allow for some movement backing up of the parking spaces in that parking area to have a little more room to back up and some, some pavement to extend onto the uh, 238 Deer Street property. The next easement plan is a proposed easement plan that will be um, a grant of some additional public pedestrian easement areas. If we can go to the next plan, and that is shown as the uh, sort of grade area to the east and south of the building. Currently, the 46 Maplewood project uh, created some public access easements around the building. Those are sort of the crosshatch areas. <clears throat> and this project is going to extend those public easements up to the face of the building. So it will make a wider pedestrian alley between the buildings. Uh, the there's a site plan, I don't know if it's next, but sheet C3, a couple sheets down, and basically that just shows you uh, the building, the walkways, <clears throat> all the dimensional regulations and tables, and um, also there's five bike racks on the exterior. Uh, we also have some landscaping. The rest of the set details the utilities, the grading. There's an off-site electrical connection that's going to be needed. And it shows floor plans and renderings. And maybe it would be nice to go to the next, to the last of the last sheet in the set that shows the rendered view. Right there. So currently there's a building that's going to be replaced with this code compliant. Um, HTC approved 21 unit micro housing structure. The parking for 30 Maplewood is what you see in the foreground. That will remain. Um, it's basically an urban infill. We're here to answer any questions and hopefully this will, this is the final step in the approval process and we'll be able to go to uh, construction um, following this meeting. The staff stipulations are all agreeable to the applicant. They involve uh, uh, getting the easements reviewed and approved and recorded along with the site plan. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over and answer any questions. Questions of the applicant? Mr. Chair? Yes. Yes, John. I. Um, coming in late on this project, and I just want to understand there's 21 apartments and what, how many, how large are they? They're all under 500 square feet. All under 500, okay. Yep. That's, that's it. Any other questions? Uh, John. Yes, Peter. When we saw last time in February, I believe we approved with the stipulation for some parking 
least. Where, where, what's the status of that? It doesn't look like there's any update on that in here. Correct. So this conditional use permit uh, was approved with uh, two conditions, and the applicant understands that the the conditions must be met prior to the issuance of a building permit, and. Um, Without having this approval here tonight, it's a little hard to go out into the marketplace and uh, make those commitments because um, those commitments are going to involve somebody tying up some parking spaces, and they probably wouldn't want to do that unless they know that there's a project that's been approved, and also the applicant is not going to spend the money to do that exercise and tie up the spaces until they're ready to pull the building permit. So uh, they have made some inquiries in the neighborhood. They've talked to some people, but there's nothing official to report on those conditions, but they're fully aware that those will need to be met before the issuance of the building permit. Yes, Jen. Um, so what's your backup plan if you find that people who own these micro units also own a car? In other words, if you, if you have these seven off-street parking spaces that you found and what happens with the other 14 units should they have cars sure so the um what the and i have a copy of it here so the um in your submission packet that's where it lives uh give me a second There is a page that is right before, they're not numbered, but it's right before the drainage analysis and after the parking study by the um, <clears throat> Laurel Palmer. It's a draft lease provision document that's in your packet. So basically, um, I can read it into the record if you'd like. Uh, the tenant, this is the draft, so it needs to be reviewed and approved, but what we're proposing is the tenant shall not be provided with any on-site parking. Landlord and tenant will make efforts to ensure that any cars used by tenant during the lease period will have a designated off-street parking location. Tenant shall indicate at the time when the lease is executed whether they will be using a car during the lease period. If they do intend to use a car, then landlord will provide a list of options for available off-street parking for the vehicle, and tenant will choose from among those options as to where they want to park the vehicle. Landlord would then arrange for a parking lease for the space, and the cost of such parking space will become part of the rent to be charged to the tenant. The obligation of the tenant to advise landlord of tenant's use of a car shall continue throughout the term of the lease and be applicable even where tenant acquires the use of a car subsequent to execution of the lease. Accordingly, at any time during the term of the lease, the tenant starts to use a car, then tenant shall notify landlord of same and arrangements will be made for off-street parking as described above. <clears throat> Yes, Council Moran. For the record, that was my requirement. I insisted that the landlord be take responsibility to make sure if their tenants actually did have cars, that they solved that problem so that we weren't leaving it up to the tenants. That was the whole idea behind it, because their theory is they're not going to have cars, but if they did, we wanted a plan in place, and that's what this language is about. <clears throat> and you're satisfied with this language? Mm -hmm. Any other? I mean, I'll let Attorney Sullivan get the final say, but <laughs> <laughs> based off of my request, yes. He wields the hammer. I'd just like to say I think that's a great idea. I'm glad that you thought of it because I, I just don't want a, another developer coming back and saying, oh, now we can't fill our micro units. Everybody insists on having a car. I don't think that's the planning board's issue. 
So I think I, I think this is a good solution to that being a recurring theme here. And it still allows people to decide if they want a car or not in order to be a tenant of a micro unit. Mm -hmm. I understand this building is closer to downtown than the other building, but they both they're both within walkable distance. So I will say that it's uh, it's actually now I'm putting my professional hat on. It's quite a difference in terms of they're both walkable, mm -hmm. but it's highly likely that this is a place where you won't need a car as much. And the reverse can happen if, if parking is required and it's provided, you will create car, people having cars that wouldn't be there otherwise. So you have to be careful about that. Mr. Chairman, if I can add that both that item, the lease, the draft lease reviewed by the planning director and the city attorney and the off street parking um, agreement, both of those are conditions that would have to be preceded to the, um, uh, the issuance of the building permit. So those are part of the original approval and will be fully enforced. Mm -hmm. And the, currently, the patrons of the establishment and the employees are using the parking garage, so which is very close, and very walkable. So it's almost like those will be replaced with tenants going forward. Any other questions for the applicant? Yes, Franco. These are all going to be studio apartments, correct? There's uh, if we go they, the next sheet. I know they're micro, but essentially studio apartment, one bedroom. Yeah. Is it going to be limited to one person? I'll let the architects give you the skinny on, on that part of it. Uh, Mark Janini from McHenry Architecture. Uh, there are going to be one bedroom apartments. Um, and then you know, there, there's no limit at this point to one, if it's one person or two tenants. But um, maximum would would certainly be two just based on the size. That would be my concern is the same issue with parking. You get two people, 21 units. One of them may have a car, but yeah. it seems like that's kind of been addressed. Yeah, we we'll go back to the, the lease language. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other, <clears throat> excuse me, any other questions? Being none, I will open up the public hearing. Um, anybody would like to speak to, for, or against this application? Good evening, Elizabeth Bratter, property owner 159 McDonough Street. I think we have some leprechauns in here because I've seen a lot of interesting things happening. Um, in regards to 238 um, Deer Street, the biggest concern that I have is it abuts the neighborhood that is currently in a pilot program for a neighborhood parking program. And therefore, I don't want this to fall through the cracks. I want to be sure there's a big red sign on the outside of this file that says before they get their building permit, they have to provide seven secured spots that they have their lease and that somebody is babysitting that lease. Because I could easily say, you gotta, we're going to find you a parking space and it's in the lease. But if the tenants don't understand that the lease is a legally binding thing, we could still be stuck with 14 people who don't have a place to park. Um, so this is an experiment. Um, it was made clear by the planning board this is an experiment. And therefore, I would like to be reassured that this will be babysat 100% because the overflow into the neighborhood could be as much as 21 to 42 cars. And that's where they'll park, because parking is free in the neighborhood at this point, And parking in the garage costs money. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak to for or against this application? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Charles Dye. I'm representing the 30 Maplewood Avenue abutting condo association. I live at 111 Bridge Street. Um, I want to change the tenor of some of the hearings you often hear, uh, the applicants did a spectacular job working with their neighbors, their immediate neighbor. And um, we expressed some concerns associated with drainage and some other things, and the engineer worked through those problems with us in a collaborative manner. It was a great thing. And we're very much in, in support of the project. About a year ago, the board sent this board 
uh, uh, excuse me, the condo board sent this board, HEC, TAC, and the applicants a letter saying, in essence, a couple things. One, we support the project uh, and the idea of, of renovating that building. And the other is that if you were to bring up the site plan, there's that big yawning open parking lot, which would be a great place to put heavy equipment if you wanted to build the building. Um, the stripes went on a new parking on that parking lot on November 24th. A lot of money got spent getting that done right. And so there's no appetite for the association to have construction equipment cross that parking lot to build. I think you understand that because in the planning board's recommendation to you, it calls out something called a construction management plan. I just want to make sure that that plan contemplates building the building from the Deer Street side. Um, you know, again, I think everyone's done a great job here. I just want to make sure that our concern gets addressed. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Here or on Zoom, I'd like to speak to for or against this application. Mm -mm. Any second time speakers? Third time speakers? I'm going to close the public hearing. It's up to the board. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'd make a motion that we vote to grant um, site plan approval with the included stipulations A through D, and I'd like to, if I get a second, I'll, I'd like to add to that. Second. Um, I'd like to, uh, uh, on a second thought of thinking about everything and hearing everyone speak tonight, I know there's a lot of concern about the parking, so I'd just like to add a stipulation that there's a one-year report back to the city on just how the parking, how many tenants have come in, how many parking spots they found, and whether or not the actual plan is working. Um, I think that that would be ease the planning board's fear of, you know, something going wrong if they have to come back a year after the issuance of the occupancy certificate mm -hmm. to to report that back, if the second's amenable to that. Agreeable. Is that a report back to this board? No, to the, to the, staff. To the staff. Yep. That way the staff will know whether or not it's meeting the requirements. Did I, I, did I mishear? Again, path, I, I heard A through D. Yeah, A through D is already in our, um, oh, sorry, I didn't flip the page. You're right. It goes A through a, a, G and, and then add that, and then we'll add in H and I. So we can make a G number one. <laughs> or maybe it's actually subsequent, it so it should J be, anyway. no, it should be H I J. Yep. Never mind. Make it a J. Sorry. Sounds good. That's me. Thank you for that clarification. <laughs> I'm like, oh gosh, and it helps if I don't flip the page. The comment, the, com the comment that we had from the neighbor on the construction, I know we've got a construction management agreement. Do we need to add that or just it's clear on the record? You know, not. I guess I would ask whether or not the staff feels that would be necessary, if that would be part of the construction management this is um, plan already. It's also the. Um, condition A, temporary easements will be needed for construction. So, you know, whether or not they get those easements is right. up to the abutter. So, yeah, I don't, I, I'm just raising it because it came up during yep. the public hearing. Um, I think that con I think that consideration could be added, I mean, to the, uh, to a qualifier to the construction mitigation plan that the applicant, uh, um, uh, in development of the construction mitigation and management plan, um, look to uh, to stage from Deer Street, if possible. Mm -hmm. Basically, stage all heavy equipment. Yes. Okay. Was it, I guess that was a another amendment. <laughs> yeah, that's a little added stipulation. Agreed. However, okay. they wish to letter that into the group. Right. Did you have a? <laughs> comment yeah I agree with that I think if that was to be added to um, item a is that yes yeah yes. no, it'd be B it'd be added to um, conditions precedent B okay because that would be needed if a if they could not achieve a if a says they should they will be needed but if they can't get those easements then the then we other need to make sure would be on through Deer Street to look into um, building this through Deer Street. Right, yeah. right. 
Well, I think we so get there either way. So I don't know how, if you want to make that clearer. In well, there, is, is, I've a got a question now for our planning director. Is the are the easements in A? Are they other than construction in A? Um, it's my understanding those easements relate to construction. It does actually say temporary easements will be needed I'd, for construction. So, I I saw that. I just wanted to be sure that it was sort of. And I remember asking specifically about this one uh, to our um, our TAC, and I said, well, specifically where? And they said, well, they'll need them all around the perimeter, you know, depending on where they hit, where they t you know are staging their construction. But I think that uh, I think that you I think the condition should be added to B. Right. So what we do is we make sure that heavy equipment mm -hmm. only comes in through Deer right. Street. Mm -hmm. They might be able to get easements for staging and whatnot if they need extra room against the building, but. I think that's the point. Right. So, Beth, is mm -hmm. I, if I understand it, then the you would add to B as in boy, yep. the heavy the heavy equipment being staged from Deer Street. Correct. Everybody understand what we're considering here. Are we ready for a vote? I was just going to make yes, go one comment, Chairman. Um, you know, I think, uh, like it was stated earlier, um, when when the planning board looked at this for the uh, the, the parking um, over a year ago, I think we all felt at that time that it was go we were going out on a limb. There was definitely some risk involved. This is a project that's uh, unique for sure, and I think we all want to see it definitely succeed. Because I think this, if this project succeeds, succeeds then it's definitely going to be a, um, a good template for how to pull this off in the city because, um, yeah, I think it's a great project, um, and I, I really hope it does, does work. So. Yeah, uh, Go ahead. I was going to say I can concur, and thank, thank you, Corey, and, and I appreciate the motion. Was it Jay for the yes. year look back? <laughs> I mean, I, Ever since that came up, there was a lot of concern from residents like Elizabeth Bratter and and other from that neighborhood. And there's so much pressure and on the neighborhoods surrounding downtown with similar parking issues that um, in order for this to be successful, I think that really brings a proof to that model. So that's... Uh, Makes a lot of sense. Thank you. I, yes, I just like to add to that. Um, for the record, we did have a lot of input when we were listening to this at parking, and I've spent over 20 years in that neighborhood behind where this is being built. So I truly understand, which is why I came up with that whole request about making sure that they did the parking. So I think we have hopefully addressed, and we'll find out a year after it's built if it actually works or not. So it's our test. And something I was going to mention later in the meeting, but I think it's appropriate now, and it picks up on what the applicant was saying. <clears throat> what happens after these meetings, the board's decisions get reduced to writing as a requirement of the statute that has to happen, I think, within five days. Mm -hmm. And those get reduced to writing. It's a letter of decision, and it's, I have to sign it, and it goes to the applicant, and it goes to everybody else and staff. It becomes a part of the record that was one of the to topics mentioned earlier. Um, there's also a gentleman by the name of Vincent Hayes, who's our land use compliance agent. Mm -hmm. And I met with him for some time last week or whenever recently. Um, his job is to look at those letters of decision, the conditions on the plan, and to work with the landowner, public works, and the other folks to make sure that all those conditions are satisfied. And he doesn't approve the release of a bond which came up in the earlier application until those conditions have been satisfied or the permit or the building permit he has or the building permit he also controls the building permit which the applicant again mentioned here uh, because I had a, a concern earlier today and I discussed this with the planning director so uh, there there are a number of steps that happen after we take an action that are very formal and official and sort of follow through with uh, what 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 we're talking about I can add to that, Mr. Chairman, that we hope to bring um, Vincent Hayes to walk through his process with the board and really explain the things that he looks at. He is a muddler. He works with multiple departments. Everyone knows him. He works with legal. He works with the building department. 
He works with the planning department and public works to understand and coordinate the implementation of the um, the stipulations that you provide from the dais, and he really uh, uh, will spend some time talking to you about uh, how you can work better with him and also his process in general. He is a great uh, member of the staff team and really does that post-entitlement coordination for, uh, for the city. So with that digression, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> but I thought the board probably wanted to, should know that. Um, yes, Jane. Yeah, I'd just like to make probably a final comment about this, which is I'd just like to emphasize that um, I, I feel like we are very open to developers working in partnership with the city with regards to what will not be a one-time issue around identifying par parking. Mm -hmm. So um, I just really, I, I think part of this experiment is to see <clears throat> will the 21 units fill and what will be the mix of the 21 units that will have cars and where will they find even those seven parking spots that will become parts of leases. All of that's really important to seeing how, where are we with absorption of parking, including forecasted parking as more and more buildings are built here. So I think it's really important and I really appreciate the developer working with us. Thank you. Any other comments? We have a motion, a second. Everybody understand it? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. We now have a public hearing. Um, and I'll just said note at the beginning, Mr. Simonis is going to recuse himself from this application. It's a request to Treadwell House Incorporated as owner for property at 70 Court Street. Requesting a conditional use permit under section 10 112-14.14 of the zoning ordinance to provide five parking spaces where 11 are required. The property is shown on assessor map 116 lot 49 and lays, lies within character district 4L1, CD4L1 and historic districts. Who's here to speak for this application? Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'm attorney John Bolson. I represent the applicant, the Davenport Inn. With me tonight is Andrew Simonis, uh, who, along with his father John, are uh, in the process of purchasing 70 Court Street. And the plan is to convert the existing office building to an eight unit inn with a caretaker uh, residence. Eric Sari, a project engineer, is also with us tonight. Uh, he's happy to answer any questions you may have. By way of background, we did appear before the Zoning Board on February 15th, and we obtained a special exception to allow the use of the property as an inn. We've also had a TAC workshop, and we now stand before you tonight seeking a conditional use permit from Section 10.12.14 to provide five parking spaces where 11 are, uh, 11 are required. Before I address the uh, CUP criteria, I would like to provide you with just a little bit of history on this property. This building has an interesting um, history. It was built in 1758 by the late Charles and Mary Treadwell, and where it served as an inn and uh, originally sat on the corner of Fleet and State Street. It operated as the Davenport Inn for many years, used primarily by lawyers who practiced in the Portsmouth Court uh, during the mid-1800s. Well, it was also the home of the uh, YWCA during the 20th century, and it was facing demolition because uh, it sat with it now the TD Bank sits, so it was moved to its current location on Court Street in 1950. The property has many architectural features um, that will um, really lend itself really nicely to be for an inn, and it will provide the public an opportunity to access those public uh, those, those amenities and those unique historical features. Turning to the specific request before you tonight, uh, you do have in your packet uh, updated site plans, you have floor plans, and a parking demand analysis as required by the ordinance. Presently, there are four parking spaces on site that will be expanded to five parking spaces as shown on the site plan. The ordinance does require 11 spaces, but the parking demand analysis that we've submitted 
suggest that six paces is sufficient for the proposed use. We do believe, though, that the approval criteria set forth in Section 10.1112.14 are all met. As to Section 10.1112.141, we have submitted the parking demand analysis. As to Section 10.1112.142, mm -hmm. the applicant believes that the available uh, on-street parking along Court Street, as well as access to nearby neighboring lots, uh, public and private, uh, mitigates the need to meet the ordinance requirement of 11 spaces. Uh, the property is 0.2 miles from the Bridge Street and Worth parking lots. It's 0.3 miles from the High Hanover Garage and the Parrot Avenue lots, and 0.4 miles to the uh, Foundry Garage. The Simonis family also owns an office building at 159 Middle Street. It's about 500 yards away, and that can be utilized for overflow parking. Also, rideshare options like Uber and Lyft will also be used to mitigate parking. And lastly, I do want to mention that this property is one block away from being in the uh, downtown overlay district, where if it were just one block away, the parking requirement would be met. So we do believe that the five spaces being provided on site and the available public parking uh, warrant that uh, the proposed use is a good one for this property. The applicant also proposed, uh, will be using, I should say, a remote check-in. So the guests will be provided in advance access codes to the building, access codes to their room, and they'll be um, directed as to parking at check-in. So they're not going to arrive blindly and then wonder where they're going to park. This will all be worked out in advance. Uh, lastly, it goes without saying, but not all guests uh, will use cars, uh, like you see in many inns in urban settings. Um, and you know, Uber, um, Lyft, you know, rideshare options will bring guests to the destination. But a city like Portsmouth, uh, very accessible by pedestrian, uh, bicycle, and you can build a, you know, use bicycles and walkway to all Portsmouth uh, amenities. So you know, we do think that will be a significant part as well. So for all these reasons, we do believe the criteria for the uh, conditional use permits are met, and we respectfully request your permission for the approval tonight. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Seems to be parking night tonight, so. <laughs> Questions for the applicant? Yes, Jane. Um, so how many spaces are available? Uh, the, the way you put it was um, like spillover or extended parking in the building that's owned next door. Are those the well, three? Well, so there's, there's four. There's, the site plan will provide for five spaces. Uh, the Simonis family has available parking uh, about 500 yards away, so if a guest doesn't have an option for, uh, that would be used, utilized for overflow parking if there wasn't an option either on site or in some of the available public uh, lots. And, and how many spaces is that? There's 22, I believe. Is that correct? 22 spaces. Oh, okay. Thank you. But your application, you, you did use the word overflow, but this application does not include that property. This That's application correct. is for this property. That is correct. So if the board has an issue with the parking, we can talk about the other property, but let's try to stay focused on this one yep. uh, because you're not. That you're, is correct. 100% correct, Mr. Chair. You know, we, we do believe that, you know, there is, you know, this is a small kind of a boutique inn. Um, we do believe that there's plenty of public parking in the near vicinity. If we're not able to satisfy it on site, you know, with all of the public uh, lots that are nearby, you know, less than a half a mile away, there's those options. Uh, we also do believe that people will arrive by Uber. Um, so, and I think this is going to be a destination when people come to Portsmouth, they walk. You know, we walk to dinner, you walk to shopping. So, you know, hopefully when people come here, they're not driving around to see what Portsmouth has to offer. They're going to walk. So they're going to come in once, and they're going to leave once. Well, the model you're using, you would know how many vehicles are coming to the site. Correct. And that's, that's one of the benefits of this advanced check-in, is we're going to know exactly who's going to have a car and who's not. And if we don't have space for them on-site, they'll be provided with the options that are off-site or the overflow parking. But 
you're not doing overflow parking. You, well, you do. You provide. A, you tell them where to park. But correct. I, I just want to clear what we're doing here. Um, it's an, board, it's an option, but it's not part of this application. But it is an option that is available, um, and we have discussed that with TAC as well. That you know it is available for overflow. I'd like to hear what the board, how the board feels about the parking. Yes, you're hiding behind Beverly. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hide a lot. Um, I guess my concern is because we're in New England. I mean, I know when I go on vacation, I typically am going to drive somewhere. But even if it's a place where I'm going to walk once I'm there, yep. I'm going to need a place to put my car. So, I guess I would feel comfortable if you at least had designated um, those three additional spaces because you have eight eight rooms, right? If I count right. Yes. Um, and then you'd have one for each one, assuming that you know everyone that came would all come in the same car. I just, I think I would feel more confident with that because, I mean, even if you send them to the Bridge Street lot, that's only, they can only park there for so many days. If they're here a week, they're going to have to move their car. So if they want to just park it and leave it, then that might be a problem unless they go all the way down to the parking garage, then they could. Um, so I guess I would feel better about this application is if we had the designated covenant for three parking spaces on the adjacent property so that we also know even if those properties weren't under the same ownership it would carry through for the life of this property but and the applicant is property. agreeable to that would the applicant agree to an easement for that for that purpose so if, if I could offer something there, uh, Mr. Chairman. So we did put in your uh, packet that is a staff stipulation that they um, either put signage saying this is restricted for the hotel mm -hmm. use, but we put the option that should the board like to see some dedicated spark parking on that space, that it be done through a parking covenant. This was the direction I received from the city attorney's office that because he owns both sites, an easement is uh, is a little complicated when there is one owner for both sites, but that a parking covenant enforceable by the city would be his recommendation. The city attorney is here to speak to that. That was an option we made available to the planning board if they sought to use it. Our stipulation says that it would be, um, uh, there would be signage restricting the parking. Uh, part of the reason we did not require the parking covenant uh, was because we it is very close to the historic district overlay and some of the other considerations nearby it's, it's in the eight spaces do seem uh, appropriately sized for the inn, but we thought that would be one mechanism of handling it we are looking to you to see if you'd like to go further than that I, the, I think that's a good point I mean I, I know I mentioned it but I do want to stress that if we were one block away we wouldn't be having this conversation mm -hmm. How does the rest of the board feel about? Excuse yes. me, I, that it's part of my original question. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding that the spaces next door to 70 Court Street are at 159 Middle Street. Well, it's not next door. It's, it's 500 yards away. It's behind it. No, it's uh, 500 yards. So if you came out of the, if you walked out of the building, you would take a left. You'd walk 500 yards down, where where Court and Middle intersect, and it's right there. Past the church. Okay. Because, yes. Because, you know, I think that people going to an inn, I, I don't know that if, they may, if it's a sunny day, maybe they want to go to the beach. You don't know what, how far their tourist desires extend. So I don't think you can totally assume that they're just going to be taking bikes and walking around downtown. But definitely they're going to, most of them are going to use a car and they're going to want to drop off a suitcase or whatever to check in to this in so I, I think eight spaces are absolutely required and I agree with the idea of having a parking covenant for three of those spaces so that there's really eight designated spaces yeah, I can appreciate that I, and that's why we you know we did talk about that parking covenant and willing to make that part of the uh, condition of approval well that might have just made that question go away <laughs> yeah I, I concur I, I mean it's nice to think that people are going to be coming to Portsmouth on uber but there's no major airport I mean there's the bus station I guess it could be coming up that way but um, am I 
I don't You're 100% right. I don't we see all, Sammy Sammy we all, I think we all want the same thing. We're not quite there as a city yet, but I think we all, yeah. you, know, you and I have had this conversation before, you know, we all want the same thing. And I think, you know, we're, we're going to evolve to that, but we're not there yet. Um, I think we heard that this, you know, earlier tonight from the West End Yards project. While we're talking about this, we, we talked about this in the other application. What about uh, one year after opening, one year mm -hmm. report to see how it's doing and whether or not the covenant is adequate or even maybe yeah, is I think it, that's is good. needed at I all? I think that's important for the city to know that. Mm -hmm. One year follow-up. Second that. Because as you're studying <laughs> these things, those need to be known. That's why I think Mr. Hewitt's idea was a good one, too, about West End Yards. Having a, you know, providing that data. I know you guys have a tall order in front of you, but this is all part of it. Okay, well, we're, we're sort of considering a motion while we're asking the applicant, but uh, any other questions <laughs> for the applicant? <laughs> Are the two properties going to be, I know we have the same humans behind them. Are they the same entities that own? Different entities. So you, you could do an easement or however you want to work it out with legal. Yeah. Okay, is there any, if there's no other questions of the applicant, I guess we are ready for a public hearing. My Open up for public hearing. Anybody here to speak to, for, or against this application? Anybody on Zoom? Elizabeth Bradder, property owner 159 McDonough Street. Parking is my thing. I appreciate that you're going to talk about a covenant because of the fact that the south end is already overflowing and those parking lots that are within walking distance are full in the summer 24 hours a day. I think that the bank has to fight to get a spot if they need an extra one. So I appreciate that you're going to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other folks here or on Zoom? Two, four, against? Second round speakers, third round speakers. I'm going to close the public hearing. Boards. Mr. Chairman, I'd make a motion that we vote to grant the conditional use permit to allow building to use or to provide less than the minimum number of off street parking spaces required by section 10.1112.35. Five parking spaces on site with the following stipulations that they will provide a covenant or slash easement or whatever is legally mm -hmm. agreeable with the city for a long term. Um, three parking spaces at 159 Middle Street um, and proper signage so that the hotel guests know that that are what spots they're to use. In addition to that, I'd like a one year follow up to see whether or not this program is working for the property to the city staff. Second. Second. <coughs> I think you explained your motion very well. Any other, so. any other comments, questions, discussion? See previously said. Just mm -hmm. <laughs> what I already said. We have a motion second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? None. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Would the board like a brief break? Or are you guys good to keep going? Keep going. So we have okay. We keep going. Power through. No hands up. We're keep, we're going to keep going. Go back to the agenda. Give me a second. We have preliminary conceptual consultation for One Market Square LLC. Um, shall we combine these? Even though it's a preliminary. What do you mean combine? So it's a preliminary consultation for both. Um, site plan and design review. Well, no, the design review is just a schedule to put them on the schedule. It's not, that's all we have to vote for. But we're talking about it while we talk about a 5A and then we schedule it under 6A. You can do what you want. I just. <laughs> what, what would you prefer? I don't care. <laughs> okay, well, let's talk about 5A. Let's have a preliminary <laughs> consultation for one Market Square LLC, the property at 1 Congress Street, a preliminary conceptual consultation to partially demolish existing buildings, construct a new three-story structure with a short fourth story. Property shown on Assessor's Map yeah. 117, Lot 14, lies in the character district CD4 and character district 5, CD5, and, has, and a historic district. 
It's also in the downtown. Who's here for the applicant? Applicant. Good evening, Tracy Kozak, Arcove Architects, here on behalf of One Market Square LLC. And uh, we are thankful for you having us here tonight for our first session with you to review our preliminary designs. We have started some work sessions with HDC. Uh, we've had two so far, and we're going through that process. Um, we're going to start just with a very high overview of the overall idea of the project with um, some context and history of the site and then a little bit on the conceptual design for the building and then we'll circle back to the civil engineering site. So that's our sequence. Uh, on the upper left of this page is the bird's eye Google map view which really tells the whole story of this project which our, our goal is to connect public spaces via pedestrian ways and to enhance those pedestrian ways and to use the building itself as a wayfinding device that will draw people in through these alleys and streets and direct them to other outdoor spaces in Portsmouth. The site, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with it, it is in Market Square on the corner of uh, High Street and Congress Street. It's across from the North Church. High Street looks directly at the North Church. There is a parking lot in back of the existing structures, a surface parking lot. Historically on the right, uh, you, there are some old photos. There was a hotel there, the Dolphin Hotel, and it was known as the National before that. It burned down in 1969. It's been a parking lot ever since. There are some wood uh, kind of shed structures on the back of the masonry buildings that front Congress Street, which will be removed. The addition on the back will connect to the masonry structures that front Congress Street. And uh, that's pretty much it for this page. Please stop me if you have any questions. And just some simple diagrams of the floor plans. There will be uh, on this uh, plan view, the left, is basically north and that is the addition. The uh, left side is the parking lot and we will be putting a new structure there. There will be one level of underground parking with 19 spaces. There is a car elevator accessed off of Haven Court. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an easement way through Haven Court and uh, the civil engineer will talk about that a little bit more. Um, and then on the ground level, it is all retail restaurant, much as it is today. And the next page uh, are the elevations. The top is High Street. On the left is the existing building. On the right is what we are proposing. We are matching the floor levels, window lines, eave lines, and roof line. Uh, three stories with a short fourth. The average roof height proposed is just under 45 feet. There is a pedestrian walkway shown in this drawing just as a diagram to demonstrate some conversations that have been initiated with the city, but that pedestrian bridge is not part of this actual application. We do want to show it because it is something that's being discussed in a larger conversation with the city uh, in collaboration with the owners to enhance the public uh, ways that surround this site. On the bottom is, uh, on the bottom left is a view down High Street and to the right is the north facade of the building which fronts Haven Court. And to the right is the Congress Street existing uh, facades. We will be restoring those to pretty close to what they were originally. The storefronts that you see today are drastically altered from the original buildings. They are currently modern aluminum storefronts with different shapes and a lot of the cast iron storefront detail has been lost. Uh, some of the coining and window heads have been lost so we're going to bring that back. That's it for that page. And uh, just some 3D views on the upper left in that ochre yellow, that is the project site. The left side facing the church is existing and the back side to the right of the picture is the new addition. Uh, to the right is the proposed restored facades on Congress Street. We are putting a, uh, proposing a new dormer on 3 Congress Street, which is the building to the left. And on the bottom uh, is the intersection of the Haven Court uh, Way and High Street. And um, 
the connections through the there is an existing building behind the brick building. Uh, so on High Street, um, 18 High Street, uh, it's currently a wood structure with that arched cornice on top, and that will become the new uh, primary entrance to this block. It will pretty much be uh, one, in, it's envisioned as maybe one tenant per floor, but with one primary pedestrian entrance, which will be on High Street. Uh, there are other doors around the site as well, which are secondary. Um, and we're going to, if you would, please skip and come back to this page with the civil engineering discussion. And with that, we come to the site and landscape design with Terrence Parker of Terra Firma Landscape Architecture. Hello, everybody. Uh, Terrence Parker here. So uh, part of my job is to, you know, blend the, the client program, the architectural inspirations, and try to create a site experience on that um, alleyway that Tracy discussed. So the, the alleyways could go all the way from um, the McIntyre building through Commercial Alley onto Ladd, onto Haven Court, down the alley where Gillies is, and then there's another alley across Fleet Street, and potentially in discussions with the city we could even Event, you know, uh, hopefully hook up with uh, the, the Worth Lot and Vaughn Mall. So my work uh, is trying to create, you know, excitement in that alleyway. So, you know, with the, with the, the glass um, partitions that Tracy has with the, with the tower there and taking some of the client programs of may, maybe wellness, I got on the, the theme of, you know, maybe we take the, the concept of a, a labyrinth which, start, which started in Greek myth, mythology to capture monsters. It evolved into spiritual pilgrim, pilgrimages. But now it's used for wellness and mindfulness. So if you can imagine taking that circular thing and stretching it out so it has a, the paving pattern is on the ground so you're, it, you're engaging with the mindfulness of watching your steps through there and you know, playing on that playful pattern. So that would, that would go from Haven Court and migrate all the way down to Gillies, and it might look like that with a, with a radial pattern at the, the High Street and Ladd corner where the architecture is. Uh, you can see some of the um, stone benches that, um, from, that I designed on Chestnut Street that we would have. We would create an amphitheater in the back alley there at the top, uh, the top elevation um, above Gillies. And there's some lighting inspirations here. So we plan on having that alleyway really well lit with arches and uh, catenary lights and other, other light features. So they, they're trying to pick up on some of those themes here that Tracy established in the building. And the, the bottom from Fleet Street looking up would be a series of you know, really interesting stairs in, in sets that we, you would meander up. And it could take some of the, also take some of the um, inspiration from Tracy's building you know, and have lamp posts that had glass and, you know, prism um, lanterns that would illuminate the path. So you can see those images here. Um, so we're trying to make it a really exciting back alley to, you know, um, to create that level of interest in, you know, being a pedestrian in the, 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 the hidden byways of Portsmouth. So it starts with you know, Tracy's building creating a wayfinding image on the corner of High and Ladd, and it continues um, throughout the rest of that alleyway there. So I'll be here if you have any questions, but I'm going to turn it over to John Shagnon right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if we go back to the cover sheet. Thank you. John Shagnon from Ambit. So that's all exciting. I get to do the, the boring engineering stuff here. Um, the uh, site, uh, if we can go to the cover sheet, they'll start there and just do one at a time, maybe. <laughs> I kind of broke up the site plan set into the on-site development and the off-site development. So the on-site development is really the, um, this is the property survey. Uh, the site's on the right-hand side, the east side. As mentioned, um, it does come from Congress Street. So this is the frontage along Congress Street. And then this lot here is excluded, but uh, it goes back to Haven Court, which we believe is a private right-of-way 
uh, owned in fee by the uh, applicant and has frontage along High Street. Haven Court officially sort of ends in this location, but it does continue as a an area that the city owns down to Fleet Street. And it's been blocked off for many years. Uh, there used to be a pedestrian access that would was allowed, but it uh, got cut off. So there is sort of a paved ramp. There's quite a steep change in grade from the top of the hill to Fleet Street. The building that is directly to the uh, to the north is the parking garage. So this is the parking garage edge. Haven Court runs along the parking garage edge. This is the Gillies um, restaurant facility here. <laughs> Uh, that is notched out. The garage used to be in this location, and then these are the spots that were added to the garage that some people might recall uh, happening. The next sheet shows the existing conditions. Again, there is a building that occupies a majority of the property. It, the buildings went to the edge of one of the lots. It originally was two lots, but the lots have been merged, so now it's one lot. The back lot is currently a parking area. It slopes from the south uh, west to the northeast, and High Street is, is narrow with some parking on the other side, and the sidewalks are of insufficient width on both sides. They're, really small and cluttered with some extremities like, oh, electrical uh, conduit pipes that stick out and uh, things that are coming off the buildings that kind of make it a little treacherous. Uh, the next sheet is the demolition plan. So the project is going to take some of those additions that were placed on the back of the Congress Street brick buildings that are more um, lower in wood frame, and they're shown in the darker hatched, uh, I mean the darker uh, uh, gray, and those will be taken off. The pavement will be removed, and then the next sheet shows the uh, additional building that is uh, proposed to be constructed kind of from the back of the front buildings uh, out to and along uh, Haven Court that's the main entrance, pedestrian entrance that Tracy mentioned. Um, and then if you go this way, uh, Ladd Street ends up connecting at Market Street to the end of Commercial Alley. And then um, further down, when you go down this um, area that goes out to Fleet Street, there is a possibility someday because uh, there is a little back alley that goes out to the Worth parking lot. So it kind of, that's in the off-site improvement section, and that's not what we're here talking about, but we're bringing the boards, uh, bringing you aware of what this developer would really like to do is enliven that whole corridor and connect it and make like a new pedestrian uh, walkway that would connect a commercial alley to the Worth parking lot. That's a bigger thing, and we need to work with the city, and we're going to reach out and do that. But uh, we want to let you know that that's an exciting part of what we're thinking about for this project. Uh, the next sheet shows utilities. And as a part of the Fleet Street reconstruction project that will be coming to um, design completion, there's some uh, utility infrastructure that uh, will go up this corridor and uh, connect some electrical connections that will uh, make a loop and allow for uh, more undergrounding of electrical utilities. Uh, we also have been in, in touch with um, the Public Works folks and we're looking at redoing High Street, replacing sewer and water, and that's shown on this plan. Next sheet is a grading plan. Uh, there doesn't or there won't be a lot of changes uh, to Haven Court. Haven Court is very active. Uh, the 
Newbury's, so-called Newbury's building. This building down here has the majority of their deliveries that come up Haven Court and deliver to the back side. They also have an existing uh, dumpster uh, out in this back alley. So part of what we're going to try to do is, well, part of what we need to do is keep that alley available for those deliveries. So we're not anticipating changing the grades all that much. If we did the connector bridge, it would be above the area that's traveled. Uh, but we're looking at providing for an alternative to having a dumpster at street level that may involve uh, some things that we did at 60 Penn Hollow, whereby the trash would be loaded into the basement through chutes at street level and then taken out uh, through the garage. As far as the grading goes on High Street, we're thinking about making that street level grade like what was done on Chestnut Street so that we would be able to we'd take out the curbs, make it uh, make the ability of vehicles and pedestrians to, to coexist uh, in, a, in, a, in a, uh, a better way uh, so those sidewalks could be made wider. Um, and we'll get into more of that later with the final design. But we wanted to give you a heads up. I think the next sheet goes into the architectural. We can look at that other exhibit that's called the parking plan. I don't think we need to uh, too much. It just, what we did is we looked at the various levels of the parking garage. That's what that shows you. So starting on the left is the lower level. Uh, the, the parking garage does not, the lower level does not go out to the same edge as the upper levels. So as you go up the garage, the parking shifts into that recent or maybe 15 year old addition. And that allowed us to look at the levels of the garage and look at the levels of the proposed building and identify, okay, if we were going to connect, then this level would be the level to connect. And how does that line up with the parking spaces in the garage, cognizant of what kind of an impact it would have, and it, it would impact two parking spaces if you were to do the connection. Um, so that, I think, concludes the presentation for preliminary concept. And we're looking for your feedback here tonight and here to answer any questions. Questions for the applicant? Sure, I have a question um, for you or the architect. But I, I noticed the, uh, the building looks very traditional until we get to the skyway or the walkway. And is that a, a public stairway that glassed in, or is that an elevator? Or? We call that um, the prism. It's it's really an art feature. It's a wayfinding device. It's not a habitable space. Uh, it will be used for um, s displays or um, we're potentially talking about per perhaps having a, um, a hologram which could show images of historical items or other landmarks in town. We want it to be an informative uh, device that allows people who um, approach that corner from Ladd Street coming from Market Street, they'll see that shape, which is uh, a direct, uh, in, purport, in direct proportion to the steeple, and it reflects the steeple, um, and they'll kind of turn and notice the steeple down the left, which will bring them into Market Square. It also uh, faces due north, so as the sun uh, swings around, to the south behind it, it casts a shadow in the plaza in front of it that sweeps around um, with the time of day, much like the clock in the steeple that you see in your peripheral vision. So it's making these uh, some kind of mental connections between uh, built objects and the sun and the space. And the reason it's all kind of glassy and metal at that end and more solid masonry with little tiny windows at the other end is uh, it's um, telling the story of the progression of time and development where the older buildings are at one side and the newer buildings are at the other and, and how uh, that evolution 
and uh, happens throughout the city where we have 400 years of architecture in the city and um, the, the sense of time and how that all plays together. So that's okay. the story of that. So you call it ornamental versus functional. Correct. It is uh, not habitable space. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Jane? Yeah, I love the whole labyrinth. I love some creativity. I know that's not what we're actually looking at with this building, but thank you for that moment. And I, so on that note, I just want to ask when on C3, you have that there is going to be 32% open space. What does that space refer to? Because it's not the alleyway, alleyways and the walkways and this connector. What, what is that? Yeah, I think that that also was submitted as a as a question from the general public. And <clears throat> so, the definition of open space includes walkways. So, when you think of open space in downtown Portsmouth, it's different than thinking about open space in rural areas. Open space in downtown Portsmouth includes walkways and things like Haven Court. So all the sidewalks, Haven Court, the alleyway in the back, the building is being set back uh, 10 feet in the back. So this, this whole area here is like a back alley and that is counted as open space. So it's land that's open to the sky. I guess I still, sorry if I'm missing something, but I still don't see how you get 32% open space. You can't, you can't count commercial alley that already exists or the alley to Gillies you, that already, you, you can't count that in your open space calculation, can you? So I guess you'll have to point out the specific number that is being discussed here. Um, <clears throat> That is 32% of the entire construction site or uh, in, entire development. Is that right? That's a large number. Open space. <clears throat> so in the zoning development standard table on the right hand side, correct? <clears throat> that is the land that's in character district five. So Currently, if we can go back to the survey plan, uh, one more, yeah. So the zoning is actually, the, the lot is bifurcated by zoning. Mm -hmm. So currently, uh, the property line that did exist between the two properties was a line that divided the lots into two zones. So if you look here, I, I want to be sure I get the right designation. So the, the part that is the current uh, parking lot is CD4, and then the front is CD5. So on the C3, It may be a type. You're showing 32.61 for both. Okay, so that's probably a typo. Yeah. It's clearly not. Right. But those are sort of related by zone, so we might want to have a third table or, or combine the tables. And so on the CD4, 10% is required and 5% on CD5. Do you have a? It's obviously not 32%. Do you have any idea what? What it might be closer um, to what's required. We'll have to do those calcs. Uh, I don't. I think we're looking at the entire lot, though, now because it's one lot. So it's going to be a complicated thing. <laughs> what would control? Which zone would control? Now that it's one lot bifurcated, mm -hmm. uh, would it be? Uh, the more strict, the 5%? Probably. 
or the 10 percent? I'm not sure. But if we look at the size of the building, uh, we can do it that way. The building is the building footprint is 9,500 square feet, and the combined lot area is 16,106. Okay, so uh, nine over 16, uh, four and a half over eight. You know, <laughs> we're, we're getting there. That's 20 percent anyway, right? Doing quick math in the head. Uh, um. Since this is only preconceptual design, I think we should talk in more broader strokes and bigger pictures than worrying about the nitty gritty numbers that we can look at when you come back for site plan. So with that said, I uh, things I'd like you to just keep in mind as we're looking at this is I know that there is a section for deliveries on High Street, but because you're going to be in sort of a tight area, just making sure that there's plenty of room or some sort of functionality to how, depending on the size of trucks that might need based off of what you're building, I don't know what's going to go in there, but just kind of keeping in mind how are deliveries going to happen and are they going to be able to make it in and around the site. And I think one of the reasons why that alley is so cut off, I'm glad to hear you talk about uh, trying to get rid of that dumpster because it is unsightly, but um, just think about a lot of lighting for that area. I would be... Um, if that is what becomes part of this project, I think lighting that up, especially when it's dark and at night, because um, there's not a lot of activity as far as storefronts like commercial alley. So I think that would be um, something we need to look at. And with the graded change, I know it'll be hard not to include stairs, but maybe big wide steps that kind of go down more gradually. So if people have strollers or things like that, they might be actually able to still maneuver down those kinds of stairs. So those were my comments. I think it's excellent that the idea has been brought up and initiated for connecting Commercial Alley to all the way to the other side of Gillies and uh, Bond Court because I think it's just such a great public amenity. Obviously, you have a phenomenal opportunity to integrate Haven Court with all of that. Um, and I know that these are very preliminary renderings. I'm just trying to understand how the building itself will interact with Haven Court and as Beth just alluded to like the deliveries and circulation of trucks and that if any point cars but I'm just trying to understand that backside that faces Haven Court and what that will look like how that will interact and maybe if you could expand upon some of these uh, garage style windows or openings that you have shown here um, and again I know they're very preliminary but I'm just interested in that sure so as I mentioned, the whole first floor is retail restaurant, and it's very simply that the storefronts are, um, we're showing these folding windows that lift up horizontally. And I know downtown there are several locations where we have the folding nano windows that go sideways, but we find that they um, stick out, they, they obstruct the sidewalk or the tables inside, and it's, they're difficult. So if you get the kind that fold up, they are not in the way. So those would open to the air in good weather, uh, and that would help enliven Haven Court with retail or, or restaurant and for the people passing by. Mm. Yes, Jane. And my other question was about the height of the building because, again, I, I'm not sure if I'm looking at the building standards correctly, but I think the maximum height is 40 feet, and you said it's 45. So it's a two-part question. So is it actually higher than the maximum? And is it going to be the highest building around that market square and by design? Great questions. Uh, so the first question is what height actually applies to the back part of the parcel um, now that it, it is combined as one lot. And I think that question is under review. So uh, we did have a variance request uh, for, uh, submitted to the Board of Adjustment, which we put um, on postponement while that exact question is uh, further clarified. Um, the second question, the height. Uh, we are, you can see from the top elevation, we are matching the height of the root building it's attached to exactly. And um, I did not bring the massing diagrams for the buildings around it. The building across High Street is at least as tall, if not a little bit taller. There's, I believe, one more story of uh, occupied space on the uh, Pierce Block building on High Street. Um, at least the side fronting Congress Street is higher. And uh, the other building is a parking garage, and we're aligning our 
um, third floor with the um, upper floor of the parking garage. And above that, we have the, the sloped mansard uh, level with the dormers. And then I don't know how high the steeple of the North Church is, but since you pointed out that sort of association, which I think is really interesting, I would just hope that it not be higher than the steeple of the North Church in this town. <laughs> uh, so, yep, great question. So on the lower left diagram, that is a two-dimensional uh, elevation. And on the, in the background, in white, you can see uh, an exact elevation of the steeple. That's taken from the 3D city model and our building on the right. So our building on the right is um, maybe a, a little less than a third of the total height. <laughs> so yeah, thanks. Thank you. Corey. Thank you, Chairman. Um, one thing just on the, the building height, I know this, this came up on a, uh, a similar um, style building um, a couple blocks away, but uh, just bear in mind, you know, is, is the way I interpreted that development at the time. But you know, the flat top mansard roof and how that's measured versus the um, gable and hip, hip roof and how you go about getting that. So, um, yeah, just keep that in mind. Um, you know, typically, at least in the ordinance, it's if it's a flat top uh, roof then you're measuring from the top. At least that's how I interpret it. Um, I guess, yeah, sticking with some of the building things, that, you know, the only reason I bring this up is just preliminary conceptual cons consultation is that, you know, the, uh, that your, your main entranceway there, that, I think that's a great historical facade. And mm -hmm. I just kind of, the proposed addition kind of seems to be swallowing it up a little bit. Um, and I don't know if, you folks have looked into, um, you know, doing different, uh, you know, making that, taking that addition and breaking it up into different facades just to give it, you know, obviously it's one building, but, you know, almost kind of trying to keep with that character of individual buildings. Just a, just kind of a comment, I guess, more than anything on that. Um, I think one thing um, in the, uh, I'm sorry, bear with me for a second but uh one thing just in the um i think the pedestrian access is a fantastic idea um the you, city needs more ways to get to gillies that's just a given um so <laughs> i think that's a great idea um and, yeah connecting through i think is, is fantastic the one issue that i do have um and this kind of relates back a little bit to the open space is the the car elevator coming out onto that I mean, ideally, it would be fantastic if the cars were not even, uh, you know, associated with it at all. I do realize you've got to get cars into the basement somehow. So um, how, you know, if we're going to be counting that towards open or community space or, you know, something of that nature, I think we really got to uh, do that tactfully um, and just, I guess, almost go above and beyond your, the typical, you know, the door opens up, the light comes on, you know, the car. And I don't, I don't know what that is, you know, to try to really, because there's quite a few parking spaces down there. And so there's going to be a fair amount of traffic coming and going. So how do we, how do we make people feel very welcome in that pedestrian space when they're walking, but there's the occasional car. So that's, that's tricky. Um, the only other comment I really have is, Right now, or at least I think, I'm sorry I didn't drive down there <laughs> today or recently, but um, there used to be, a, or maybe there still is, a big tree right outside. That, and that tree might be gone now. I think they just cut it down. They did just cut it recently. down. Oh, shit. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. never mind. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank this you. Tree. It's right there. Anybody else? Just going back to the grading of Haven Court and the interaction again between Haven Court and whatever retail or restaurant is right there. Right here and as existing, it has some trees and some landscaping. It may not be beauteous right now, but it could have that effect where people are walking up and the, there's a, a separator 
there's a buffer between Haven Court and that restaurant and that pull-up window, which I think allows for that open-air feeling, uh, but just gives that uh, delineation between public and private space. And as Jane had alluded to, like really emphasizing that open space and emphasizing that we do want those pedestrians to come through and look at the building and, and then thereafter have the retail folks look at something a little bit more aesthetically pleasing than the back of the parking garage. Could you explain the uh, your circulation? Beth mentioned the, the alleyway in the back of the building, sort of um, running perpendicular to Congress Street that stops at the Abutters mm -hmm. building. Um, I assume that's going to be, I see you've chamfered off the corner of your building to allow vehicles to get in there, I presume? Uh, no vehicles, and we're working on the shape of that chamfer. Uh, I think the latest rendition, it's, it's more of a notch and we're going to accentuate that into a seating area and sort of a, a pause along the journey with um, some nice features and lighting and, and some green, growy elements of some sort that will thrive in that area. Uh, but we don't see cars and elements going, uh, vehicles going up and down that alley. There will be some trash chutes, so there may be some hand trucks or uh, whatnot, but the uh, removal of the trash uh, would come from a subterranean trash room. Um, there are bins. They get put on a, a cart or small vehicle, and they come up the uh, elevator, the car elevator, and go out that way. Uh, but, I mean, there are vehicles that would still access the Newberry's building, but they would not turn down that alley. What is the function of the alley, then? What, it's to allow light and air to the Newberry's building, really. Uh, there's also an egress stair in the addition that would exit out that alley and down onto Haven Court. And I understand the difference between an analysis diagram and a proposal, but the pedestrian connection to the High Hanover, um, is that just a study to see if it's possible or what? Uh, yeah, we kind of wanted to test the height and size and mass and make sure we could get a truck under it and still effectively connect um, floor levels in a way that's handicapped accessible. Uh, it would be envisioned that the um, public who could use that, that uh, walkway bridge to access amenities in the new building that is proposed. Uh, in my experience, those decant pedestrian life away from the street, and I'm personally very opposed to them. I've studied them in Minneapolis and Milwaukee in great detail and there and you know understand the weather issues and whatnot but <clears throat> the idea of taking people away from the street is a difficult one for me. So that's a personal comment based on my experience. And the other thing again personal it's not not our menu our venue but the prism you did mention like a clock tower. Mm -hmm. If that was a clock tower, I think it'd fit contextually a lot better with this location in downtown Portsmouth. It's so. a sundial. <laughs> clock tower with a sundial. Yeah. Um, it's a very modern, I, I get it, but I, I feel it's, it's out of context. Again, personal comment. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have anything? Is that it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So are we going to schedule a design review? Um, I think you have to read 6A in as our next application, and then we can do it. make a motion. Okay. Yeah. Now we will consider a design review application acceptance for the request of one Market Square LLC for the property at 1 Congress Street, requesting design review approval to partially re demolish existing buildings and construct a new three-story structure with a short four story, fourth story. The property shown on assessed map 117, lot 14, and lies within character district CD4, character district 5, CD5, and historic district. Um, and I believe this is a request to schedule the approval, not to actually grant the approval. Correct. I'd make a motion that we um, have identified uh, adequate materials for design review and that we should schedule for our next uh, meeting to do design review. So we begin that process. Second. Thank you.
Yes, Jim. I have a little, I have a question about the, there's a dispute I understand with the zoning board that was going to happen to zoning board this week. It was postponed. Is that something that has to be resolved before we proceed with this? So if I might answer that, I think um, the variances and the any other mm -hmm. approvals that are needed from any of the other uh, commissions were um, uh, do not have to be resolved before you accept the completeness and go through the design review process. Uh, when they come back to the planning board with a formal application, those would need to be addressed fully. Um, there are variances that might still be identified as part of the TAC review process, and even in your next um, uh, review of this, you may identify some things that might generate some additional uh, consideration. So I would say that those are, do not have to be resolved at this point. Um, if you, we can certainly start to begin to identify those at this stage, but it certainly do not have to be uh, completed by with this acceptance. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? So I think we need to formally schedule. I said at our next meeting in my motion. Okay, and that was seconded. I'm starting to fall asleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I need a quick break. Five minutes. So moved. <laughs> I think you can just call one. He doesn't need our permission. <laughs> no.
32. It's almost certain. Is that something they did? Yeah, that. right. It's just early. Yeah, just, I just think it's going to We'll take you. <laughs> okay, I think so too. We'll, we'll take you all. Okay, we are back live. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, next item on the agenda is to discuss dates and topics for our uh, training with the New Hampshire Municipal Association, I believe. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. In response to the board request for training, we have uh, reached out to the New Hampshire Municipal Association and talked to them about what resources they have available. They have offered up uh, Mr. Stephen, Stephen Buckley as the Legal Services Counsel for the Municipal Association. We do get uh, some free training from them, but we also have to pay for some training, but the first session is free. Um, after we pulled the planning board, we got a, settled on a date of March 30th at 6 p.m. Um, we would like to go ahead and schedule a special meeting on that date for some training. Um, the topic would be, um, I think, uh, just the planning board roles and responsibilities, but that really won't take the entire two hours that is part of the training session. So we will also be um, working with the chair tonight to identify an additional topic you might like to uh, hear from Mr. Buckley on. We will be sending a similar poll out for April we'll, when we'll be proposing a uh, joint meeting with the Conservation Commission to discuss uh, wetland CUPs. I know that's of great interest to the planning board. Uh, and uh, Mr. Buckley has agreed to speak to that topic as well, just um, what state law says, take a look at our ordinance and really understand like best practices and maybe what some case law has said related to wetland CUPs to provide some basic guidance to the board. But the uh, topic today is really to talk about that March 30th um, uh, date and what you would like to, uh, to hear um, at that meeting. I believe that we had talked about beginning at 6 and having a discussion period before um, Mr. Buckley uh, begins with us at 6.30. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? Yes. So just a just brief sort of time to have some discussion work with the chairman to identify some topics where the board can speak informally about some things of concern. And then um, at 6.30, Mr. Buckley will begin his session. So at this point, I turn it over to the chair to uh, work with the, uh, the planning board and tell me what you would like to hear uh, talk about that second hour. So what I foresee, and I, a lot of you have mentioned the idea, your concerns about, you know, what does the board do? How does it look at the master plan? What does it do with <clears throat> looking at regulations? How does it tie in with the best committee? And she's going to give us a report soon, in a few minutes, um, not like in the future. Um, so we'll hear about that. I thought we should talk about, I'm going to talk with Mr. Buckley before the March 30th to find out what's he has on the menu of possibilities. I know we can all go to the Municipal Association website, but having talked with those folks several times myself, I know they, they're, they're active, they're, they stay attuned with uh, case law, and I expect he will keep us current with those things at the state level, what might be happening. Uh, hopefully he won't get into what the legislature is proposing. I don't care what they're talking about. I just want to know what they've done. Um, so. If you have anything in particular that you, a particular topic, uh, right to know question, um, I don't know, something that you found the way the board is functioning, a question that you have, if you, now would be a good time to say it and I'll discuss it with staff and with Mr. Buckley and if, if necessary uh, with our own city attorney, uh, depending on nature of the question. And if you don't have any, I'll dream it all up with Mr. Buckley. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. um, I, I, I'm not sure about the poll. Um, I don't know how that was done. I just can't literally recall. But um, maybe you guys could use SurveyMonkey or something like that in the future because I'm not going to be here on March 30th. And I've been one of the people really drumming about training. And mm -hmm. I've been doing a lot of training on my own. So one of my questions is, I mean, is he going to go over the roles and responsibilities that we already have copies of from the New Hampshire Strategic Office of Initiatives, or is this something more in depth than that? Uh, because, and will it be videotaped so that I can catch up on it at least passively? I'd like to be an active part of it, but I'm not, I'm not even in town on March 30th. So I travel a lot, and I'm very worried about the scheduling of all of this that I get a chance to be involved. Well, I know you have done a lot of work with the, the, the information available online. I, I'll ask that question because 
that handbook is not something they produce, mm. and, but I know they're familiar with it, and I think they even provide a link to it. So that's a good question to ask him. Like, for instance, Stephanie sent around to us that we could attend the um, noontime, I think they call themselves PLAN, P-L-A-N. I, I can't remember what that stands for, but I actually did attend that today, and I highly recommend it. It was um, something that they do monthly, and today's topic was about um, development as a, as a regional initiative, like how planning boards are supposed to look at regional impact if, they're, if the projects before them have that. Uh, I found it really informative, but it's because I was available. <laughs> so. Um, I just like to speak to the. Uh, they've actually started doing those monthly because online because they can't. They always had an annual spring conference. I've been to many, many of them, um, and they were very. They were all day at a conference center with people from all across the state, and it's been extremely informative. And they always um, had legal updates and beginning classes and classes on specific topics, and it's always been quite enjoyable to listen and to hear other people's ideas and i've always thought training was a big part of my job as a planning board member in the mm -hmm. past so that's why i attended a lot of those i think a lot of what um, mr buckley is probably going to really focus on is um, exactly how your role is and how you should see your role from a legality statutory kind of side of things like what is your your job and how is that job supposed to, what roles and responsibilities you have, but I think he'll probably not be straight out of the manual, but probably be something that's a little bit more in tune. And to talk about regional impact, um, our actual regional planning um, company that we're uh, associated with, uh, I actually sit on the regional impact. We just got scheduled. There's a large development in Brentwood that is having regional impact that we just scheduled a meeting to go and look at that. So there is actually a group out there that looks at a lot of the regional stuff on a regular basis and every planning board has the right if they think that one of your applications has a regional impact that you can consider it that and then it goes to the Rocky and Planning Commission where they get a group together who looks at it based off of the statute what we're allowed to look at and then we just basically advise that planning board uh, from that town where where that project should go. We've done it for two projects down on Route 1 that are in Rye on the Greenland and Ham Northampton line as well. So we've had a lot in the most recent months of things that are regional impact and if they are concerned to Portsmouth, obviously I pay very close attention, but we look at this as a region all, all the time, shall we say. Good, thank you. Anybody? Is that a quivering hand, Jim? No, I'm sorry. No, just quivering. <laughs> <laughs> you anything, Corey? No, uh, I, I, I think, um, I think there was a couple of trainings when I first came on uh, back in 2016. Uh, sorry, um, and Stephen actually did both of those trainings, and I found them very, very helpful at the time. You know. Uh, I attended one through the Rocking and Planning Commission, and that one was, was good. And then he also did another one here for the, the planning board at that time. Mm -hmm. And so they were, he was really good, especially going over um, roles and responsibilities, but also touching uh, base on a lot of uh, case studies, case law. And that helped me anyways kind of clarify, you know, if, <laughs> if you're out, if the board is outside the legal bounds, you know, what can happen, um, or, you know, vice versa. So, uh, you know, I, I thought it was really good at the time. So I do look forward to, to hearing from him again. So thank you for working on setting this up. So it's all her. Okay. Well, so Beth, would you like to give a quick update? Nope. nope. I think she has something else to oh, say before. Very briefly, I'll oh, lead that's into right. that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> in response to some uh, requests for additional information and some data related to housing development and some of the housing needs, um, staff will be preparing a report. Uh, we hope it'll be one of you know several that we bring to you over time um, for the April planning board meeting that will cover the topics of housing development, Portsmouth data and trends for the past five, I think five or six years. I think I have to work with uh, Nick Cracknell to. Um, to uh, get that correct. And then uh, some uh, American Community Survey data that identifies sort of our uh, 
our housing data. It's released annually. It identifies our cost burden. It kind of talks about the need in Portsmouth and who's cost burdened. Um, and this is a, a, some data that it, a lot of jurisdictions use to sort of track over time because it's consistently released. And then we'll be bringing some assessor's data on current housing stock. Uh, the council recently adopted a goal of increasing supply and diversity of housing and really talking about what where we are in a benchmark in terms of our housing typologies. How many ADUs, this information is available through the assessors. How many ADUs, how many condos do we have, how many single family detached. So this is a, a data that's available to us and that we'll bring that to you and uh, give you that report. Same report we'll be giving to the land use committee and I will turn it over to Councilor Moreau to talk about where, what uh, is happening with that committee. Yeah, the land use committee is uh, getting going slowly but surely not quite at the pace I was hoping for but you know we all have goals that we don't attain from day to day um, the uh, supported market group which basically looks at the policy side of our development uh, has already met and we have a charge that we are uh, currently looking at whether or not there's any areas in the city that 79e could actually I don't know how many people are familiar with RRSA 79e but it's a revitalization of basically a whether or not we have any cores and and one of the comments was well our downtown's pretty developed I'm like correct and I used the example of it would have been nice with the brewery buildings were dilapidated if we had had that in place then maybe we could have gotten some workforce housing out of those buildings so looking at our city we're, we're gathering a list of all uh, city-owned properties right now and so that we can look at different areas of the city and see whether or not that's effective the other thing we're looking at is some of the new legislation that's coming through and some of the housing opportunity zones and we're also evaluating whether or not I mean, we actually have a housing commission here in the city uh, which uh, has not been active for several years but it did create the housing policy that directs what we're supposed to do as a city it's the policy that was set so we're evaluating the policy to see whether or not it's still current to our needs we're evaluating whether or not a housing committee would actually be a good thing to have as part of the city which would be one of the um, advisory roles that it would have would be to this board as a planning board um, the other side of the house uh, we're also looking at uh, the regulatory side which our meeting is April 8th um, and on that side we're going to be looking at a lot of the current zoning the way it stands um, we're gonna be looking at ADUs how those are working are they functioning we'll be looking parking requirements we're going to be looking at a whole host of list of current zoning that we feel might need to have some adjustments based off of what's happening and what is going on and we've had some good discussions around that uh, our next full committee meeting will be May 13th and then starting in June the first Friday of every month at 9 a.m. land use committee will be meeting here at City Hall I finally have us on a set schedule and we'll get more done now that I <laughs> just scheduling these committee meetings has been a bear <laughs> it's a lot to I actually appreciated Corey said to me today it's like herding cats and I, I have to agree that is kind of what it feels like <laughs> but we're gonna get everyone on the same page and get everyone there Go right ahead, Mr. What's Smith. the status of the housing commission now? Uh, currently, it's it's legally there, but there's nobody on it, and it's not doing anything. Let's herd our cats into the housing commission. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of our discussions. That's one of the things that we are that's come up. I when I was doing my research, I, I'm looking at all of a sudden, I'm like, Portsmouth. Hey, we have a housing commission. Am I allowed but, to but, sign up? Yeah. <laughs> um, I believe it. Uh, yes. Yeah, planning board members are allowed to sit on it. Yes. Let's do it. Um, I yeah, that is one of the things that we're going to be looking at in trying to decide if I think long term the land use committee is something that can make these changes, but I think we need to make like the housing committee possibly a standing committee that takes a look at these types of things on a regular basis. Um, but we we will look at all of the legalities of that. We will then bring it forward as recommendations to the city council, who will then take all those recommendations what they can do forward I mean the policy side they'll probably take a move forward unless they feel like they need feedback from the planning board all of the zoning changes come get um, sent to the planning board to review and have a public hearing and then it goes back to City Council once you've done your review and have come up with the end changes that we have uh, recommended in whatever form that is and then the City Council does the same thing they have their readings they have their public hearing before it ever gets enacted so it's it's not a quick process but Hopefully we can get the ball rolling and start with at least a few pieces. I'm not going to say we're going to get every change done all at once, but we'll get a handful, put a packet together, and keep moving in that direction. 
and I'm happy to answer any questions. It's not 11.30 at night, so I'm much happy mm -hmm. talking about it now. <laughs> <laughs> but it is St. Patrick's Day. That's right. Hey. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. I just have a comment, a couple of comments, because first of all, I see in our planning, in our, in our agenda document today that the data that you're collecting that you're going to report on is for five years and really in my motion I asked for ten years and there's a reason for that because I really think that the planning board needs to look at these numbers not just for the context of what's being built now but to somehow look at how to manage growth I mean to have a chance to project what our future forecasts are around growth and to figure out what kind of growth control regulations and comprehensive planning we're going to do. Um, and I go around and around about this because when I look at the roles in this roles and responsibility from the New Hampshire Office of Strategic Initiatives document, it clearly points out that the planning board has a planning role in which the board identifies a vision for the future of its community and the steps necessary to achieve it, a legislative role in which it proposes ordinances and enacts regulations to achieve that vision, and a regulatory role, applying the ordinances and roles to specific situations in fulfillment of the vision. And I, I am not sure that I still totally understand both how the planning board is distinguishing from the land use committee, except that I see clearly that we are to follow the master plan if we think that growth in the town or anything else changing the character of the town no longer is reflected in that master plan that that's the revisioning piece that we're supposed to take on. So I know that we are guided by the master plan. Um, and when I hear about the land use committee, I hear that it's reporting to the city council, guided by the city council. I haven't heard any mention of the master plan itself. I think a lot of the data that you're gathering for the land use committee will also be useful to the planning board in our roles but I, I, I look forward to, and, and I really wish I was going to be at the March 30th meeting, um, I look forward to discussions that this board has about how we are going to review ordinances um, with an eye towards trying to make sure that the, not just the rate of growth, but the type of growth, the character of the growth, the building that's occurring, is it in line with what the citizens and the public inputted into that master plan that we're still following? That's a big question to be answered about, do we think we're still on track of that master plan or not? And I think along answering that question, we should hear from the public. So I, I, I wish we could discuss that further. Maybe we can do it you know, started in March or whatever, I will definitely watch the videotaped sessions and I look forward to continuing to discuss that in April. I'm not clear about it. When I look at the minutes to our last meeting in which you explained what the Land Use Committee is doing, the very last line of those minutes says the Land Use Committee will give them a chance to take a structured look at immediate changes and look at all city property to expand on affordable housing. So I, I read that very carefully in the minutes. I assume that's what you really are focusing on is like city owned property. You said that again it's in your overview tonight. Things. It's one of the things. I think you're taking many things and trying to clump things together and, and in your roles and responsibilities, Yes, we do indeed look at ordinances. We just talked about how you guys review ordinances. But at mm -hmm. the same time, you don't enact them. That's, that's the, the true legislative body of the city is the city council. They mm -hmm. are the final word on mm -hmm. everything. So I understand that. And their we... direction and policy is also what takes precedent. 
So part of that master plan and part of looking at the next master plan will be to take those evaluations of the long look back to see whether or not our master plan was effective and if not where the master plan needs to get directed. But I think, yeah, the Land Use Committee is looking at more than just city-owned properties. It's looking at many different things, as I just said a few minutes ago. So, Well, that's the first time I had ever heard it personally. That's the first time I heard that the scope is now including parking and the I'm other sorry. I was aspects. really tired at 11.30 yeah, the other night and finishing at 11.45 p.m. My brain probably wasn't working. I have very long days and many meetings and was thinking about the fact that I had to come back here to run a meeting just a few hours later. I understand so. that. And it was hard to hear for the same reasons. I was totally exhausted. But you actually read it from Because it was the only way I was going to get anything out of my brain. At that <clears throat> so inside the same document, it's got this whole flow chart about how uh, it's a, it's this document is about what the planning board is doing i'm trying to still understand what what my role and what the planning board's role is which is why i would wish to discuss that in further sessions but to me i think i've read over and over in these documents now that it's the active part of the planning board that i've not really seen operate a lot, which is to bring revisions, recommendations of revisions to the City Council for our zoning ordinance based on our master plan and whether we think from the patterns we're seeing in what we are reviewing that changes need to be occurring either in the master plan itself or the zoning ordinance. So I'm just trying to figure out how we do that part of it. Can I offer something? So I think in the legislative role of the planning board, I think that you have a role in making recommendations to the city council. I think the city council sets the, um, the work plan for staff. That is their role. They set the objectives and the work plan for staff. We take that because we, you know, we don't have a great capacity. They are the chief legislative elected officials. They set the work plan for staff. We begin that work with the community um, and I think that the Land Use Board is playing a role in that setting that work plan as well. And we bring that to the Planning Board where the Planning Board helps the staff develop, fully develop the ordinances and the recommendations that come out of the Planning Board. All the issues that are brought forward in the refinement of those regulations are the work of the Planning Board. The, the Master Plan has a whole host of policies and goals and implementation is it's not at, at, a, at a, a granular level where it tells you precisely these are the recommendations that you have to implement, but they are high-level visions that the communities articulated through that plan. And so there could be any range of amendments that are needed to fully implement the master plan, and all amendments really should be consistent with the master plan, but I'll add a caveat to that. Where state law has interfered and, and preempted something, and in this case for workforce housing, state law has had a preemptive direction to jurisdictions saying you will do this. Then I think that that also takes precedence over the master plan. In this case, that's probably true. I don't know that anything is inconsistent that, that would be proposed that would be inconsistent with the master plan, but it should be consistent with the master plan. You're absolutely right about that. So in the legislative role, I don't want to say that the planning board doesn't have a role in initiating, and I think that there will be um, I, my hope is that as we move forward with a regular work plan of amendments, the planning board will be very active in contributing to that list, and then the uh, city council will say go forth and make these things happen. So I think there is a role. I think uh, in this case, the land use committee is sort of, uh, I'd say, serving as an agent for the council in helping us to develop the preliminary round of, of uh, amendments that are going forward. I think the planning board has a role, and I see that role being a very robust role in the refinement in the public hearing in receiving input that we hear from the community and helping us to refine that. They have a very important legislative role that cannot be um, supplanted under state law. So. so if a member of the planning board has a recommendation for a revision of a zoning ordinance, that is part of this process going back and forth with land use, planning board, and city council? Like that can still be heard, that recommendation? I'm right now taking input from many people from the public, and I have requested that even the website, the city website, have a place so that any member of the public has any input about our zoning, that they can give it to us so that we can review that as part of our review. 
The planning board has the ability to, of its own volition, come up with ideas. This, the land use committee has been charged by council specifically mm -hmm. to do what it's doing, and I think the scope has expanded somewhat because it's again it's following council direction. It's a council, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a council committee, um, and as Beth has explained, it will feed back into the planning board at the planning board level. The planning board actually has to consider how whatever's proposed under the master plan. We, we have to look at that in maybe in more detail than even the council does. The council has to look to us for that. We could. We, the planning board, this group, could propose something and send it to the council for discussion. We could do that. Um, I think it might be considered, where'd that come from, um, without some interaction with the land use committee they've established. So I, I think if we, if we do have something that we think we should do, maybe feed it into the land use committee and then let that become part of the package that becomes a part of this process. Um, as a suggestion, you know, it's it, it's just uh, it, the land use committee has got other people. You know, it's not it's it's mostly councilors and planning board members, but it's got other other outside input as well. And Peter's dying to say something. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering how. So, how do we get something like a proposal of that sort into that process? Because it seems like everything's coming at us all the time. I thought I just said anybody, any, you're all residents, anyone no, but, but can send us as, as a planning board, I guess. The planning board is represented by the chairman and the vice chairman uh, in, on the land use committee. Mm -hmm. Rick and, and Corey sit as members on the land use committee. So you could certainly. You could, you could say it to us, you could say it to Beverly or, or council mm -hmm. or Beth, you know, <laughs> we're all, we're all here. Um, so yeah, not, not it doesn't have to happen during the meeting or a meeting that can no. be. <coughs> Thank you guys you. have stuff, notes you've been taking, information you've been gathering. Please feel free to put it together in a document or an email or whatever. Send it to any one of us and we will make sure it gets to the committee. Thank you. Okay, are we I, I just reasonably hope, comfortable? I hope that in our future discussions in our working meetings to come that it that that we work on clarity around both what distinguishes the two groups and how we are collaborating. I, it would be nice t to have that. I, I'm still not 100% clear, honestly. I, I just am not. Well, I think it's a little bit of a work in process. Yeah. yeah. So, like, I hope we continue to talk about it. I'll make updates every month. Mm -hmm. And I'll know more. <laughs> well, and Corey and I will do our best, too. So. And that doesn't help at all, but <laughs> we'll, we will try. Communication. Um, anything else? Any other business? Motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye